I don't want to be redundant and I apologize. I wasn't on the line to hear, but um, maybe just it's just appropriate to say that it's so nice to start our day with all of you. And uh, I want to thank you all for the, the faith that you've bestowed upon us. Um, you know, we've a lot has happened since we saw you in June. Um, we've spent a little more than half of the money in the grants, and we expect within a couple of weeks that it'll be fully um, subscribed to. So we're, we're feeling good about getting money out the door and helping people. Um, it's mostly gone really well. Uh, we've you know, learned a lot. I like to call these learning opportunities as we go. And uh, as Ted probably outlined yesterday, that you know, we have a variety of areas that we'd like to revisit with your help to, to focus on some of the people that didn't receive the support that they still need so badly. Um, and so please tell me if you didn't go over those, but I'm talking about like sole proprietors and some very new businesses, nonprofits um, and whatnot, as well as um, <clears throat> really preparing ourselves for some months ahead that, that we wish this, this crisis was gonna be over soon, but it looks like we need to buckle up for a little bit longer here and, and plan. Um, <clears throat> and we also have what we would call an, an urgent request to um, address the needs of some downtowns and communities, uh, the, the better places, safer spaces, and some municipal grant ideas that would really enable businesses and municipalities to um, continue to deliver services to people, um, but they need some money to, to make some adjustments. So we have a variety of things in the pipeline. And as you mentioned, um, we wanna talk to all of our commissioners about how things have gone and, and learn about what we wanna want to do going forward. So with that, I will turn it back over to you. And again, really um, glad to be with you all. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so just a few words. Uh, I, th I personally think th things have gone uh, somewhat according to um, our goals and um, personally, uh, my goals in terms of I think, you know, there was a lot of back and forth back in June about uh, how slowly or quickly we acted. Uh, personally, I think our committee thinks we acted very quickly and we're only able to do so by giving you a great deal of discretion in how to go forward and the ability to learn as you went forward to come back at this point in time and make adjustments. So we acted as quickly as we can, we could, uh, if we had taken the time to design these programs to the nth degree, we would still be in session right now and uh, no money would have been out the door. So I think together we did it right. And now we're here to fine tune that and hear what you've learned. We did hear about um, all the things you mentioned, but only very peripherally. We had Ted on for 25 minutes yesterday and we were, uh, hoping to drill down into more specifics, either with you or the commissioners uh, this morning. So um, I'll leave it to you as to whether you think it's best for you to share those specifics with us. Otherwise, I would move into probably to Joan at this point and let her tell us about the uh, recovery grant issues. I think that's a great path. <coughs> Joe, don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, first, I should say, um, well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for having us. I, I want to make sure that you all receive the um, interim report on the economic development grants, and if not, I could forward it directly right now to Mark Grimes. So, in there is a, a very good review of um, what we've done so far, but it really goes up to probably the data from two weeks ago. Um, but generally it's like 3,500 businesses have already been paid uh, across 22 different sectors in every county of Vermont. And, um, you know, yes, we, we tend to focus on the gaps, right? We know that we've left uh, their sole props uh, were not served and, and new businesses that didn't have a prior year to compare to were, were left out. People with less than 50% loss were left out. People with over 20 million in revenue were left out. And also our calculation 
in terms of being a percentage of revenue didn't take into consideration all of the unmet needs. So we understand the shortcomings, but having said all that, we were able to set up a system rather quickly uh, in a situation where over the summer, there were many other agencies also setting up the system uh, with the same consultant. So um, yeah, all in all, um, we were able to get some help to the most, uh, most in dire need. So first, just let me ask, do you have the report where I could share the screen and go through some of it? Is that helpful to you? We, I, I think we have, I mean, we have at least what I have is the administration's proposals going forward. And we have, oh, okay. Ted, we have Ted's work from yesterday, your beautiful restatement budget. So I, I, I did we get the, the update in terms of what's actually been done. I, I haven't seen it, but I haven't looked at emails this morning, so. Okay, so if uh, I'm able to. It? Committee? Why, why, don't you share, why don't you share it with us again? Uh, we do have the uh, outline from Ted of yesterday and we have right. Lindsay's email from uh, a week right. ago, uh, but the actual detailed report, I don't know that we've- I don't okay. see And am I sending that to Mark Grimes? Is that M well, Grimes, is that right? Right. That is correct, M Grimes at leg.state.vt.us. I've also given you co-hosting permissions. So once you send that, if you wanna just go ahead and share the screen, then you'll be able to roll right with it while I get it posted. All right, perfect. Uh, let me just figure that out. You, you, you can also just e email it to Senate Economic Development and we'd all get it and we can bring it up. Yeah, I just sent it to Mark. Um, Mark will take it from there. Awesome. Okay. And now to share the screen, let me just make sure I could see that. Um, let's see. Ah, okay, share screen. So um, what is your pleasure? Do you, I thought we should do a review of what we've done so far, and then that sets the tone for kind of going forward into what the asks are for additional funding. Is that, is that acceptable? Um, Chairman, that's fine. That's fine. Have you okay. planned, did you do this yesterday in commerce? I did. A, yes, I did a bit of this in commerce. Um, so this okay. report was sent last week. This was as per the statute that we needed to report on August 15th. Um, and it gives an overview of both the funding from Act 115 and Act 137. Uh, and we combined in many cases, the tax and ACCD data. In some okay. cases, uh, it wasn't comparable um, because we had some unique attributes that they, they did not have. This gives an idea of the amount that was subscribed for. Um, and we use the word subscribe because we didn't award everybody. Um, on ACCD, at least, we do payment files every week, uh, whereas tax is a much more straight through system uh, by virtue of their, uh, their tax system is able to calculate this. We, we set up a Salesforce system, and as you know, that, or may, may know, that's a contact management system. And then what we did is from that information, from the intake of applications, we're able to make payments each and every week. So a fair amount of interest um, in terms of amounts subscribed for. And then in terms of the amounts awarded, here are the some of the total grants awarded by county. And then the grant award amounts by county. So those are just absolute numbers and it can't really glean much from them. So what we did is we did a little bit more um, analysis, uh, talking about the grant volume by county as compared to the state employment share. And there you, you could see there aren't really many surprises. I mean, the blue, solid blue is the number of businesses served, uh, the percent of all businesses served, and then the state employment share in each of those counties. So really not many surprises there, but you could see there's a pretty um, even distribution in terms of the weight of how many people were served versus what the representation is on employment. 
and here's just more data in terms of aggregate applications, the revenue reported, this, oh, sorry, I don't know what happened there. The um, grant details by county, can't move this over, bear with me. And then again, the county percentage of overall state employment. Um, what is the, the relevance of PPB EIDL is that that shows for those people who receive state grants, how much they receive from the federal? Yes, yes, it was an aggregation of all those applications. We did ask for the amounts that they received from the federal assistance, so we have the data. And it just kind of shows this is the dollars that have been deployed in those counties, aggregate of some of the state awards and the sum of the federal as has been reported to us. So if I were to eyeball that, it looks like a very general statement would be that um, the state money equals about half of, half of the mm. uh, people were speaking federal money. Even on, yep. even, and really, it, it does that county by county pretty much, but also the total 46 to 95. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then by firm size is an interesting one as well. Um, the gray bar is percent of grant dollars. The orange is percent of employees and the uh, blue is percent of grant apps. You could see on the very first row, sole proprietors, 36% of the applications were from sole proprietors. Doesn't mean that those were all funded. Again, this is a subscription kind of data just to show the activity. Um, and then in terms of the percent of employees that represents, you'll see uh, much smaller, but, but in terms of the percent of grant apps, percent of grant dollars, um, you know, 28%, which is the largest, largest percentage of uh, employees is uh, in the 10 to 24 employee range. Uh, so we definitely, John, yep. Sorry, this is Becca. Um, can you just remind me what does WBE and MBE eligible, can you remind me? Sure, so in H966, there was a separate set aside of $5 million to go to Vermont Community Loan Fund. And uh, we ended up uh, doing those transactions for them. Half of the five million was for women owned business and half was for minority owned. And so what we did is, and, and the way the statute read, it was the set aside was for um, entities that had zero to five employees. We set aside the money for just the ones that had sole proprietors with zero employees. And the reason for that is because if they had one through five employees, they were eligible for our broader, much more expansive pool. Um, but this just shows how much demand there was from that group. Um, you know, and, and the majority of the applications. So, and we were the only ones that that was the only area like tax did not do sole props, you know, so that was the only area for them to get funding. So is this first line for sole proprietors? Are these numbers? Do they include sole proprietors who applied and were rejected, or this is just the women-owned and minority-owned businesses? Yeah, because this is the um, subscription um, data point, it really is those who applied. It doesn't mean they all were awarded. So I will go to another graph, which I think will show that. Um, bear with me a moment. Let me just find that. I thought there was another one. Uh, I thought there was another graph that showed that, but. Um, well, you have on this graph here, you have 20% of grant recipients were sole proprietors. That's right, uh, right. So that, yeah, this is the grant. This is the, uh, the, the element then that is important. The percent of grant dollars, the percent of grant recipients, and the business size contribution to state employment. 
So you can see that we really were, it's much more heavily weighted on the smaller business. And I think like right from the beginning, you know, we kind of could tell this may happen because of the cap of the $50,000 that we had uh, as a cap. So the larger businesses, you could see that even though they represent a larger percentage of the uh, state employment, um, they represented less of the grant recipients and less of the grant dollars. I'm just still struggling with this 20% sole proprietors of all the grants you gave out, one fifth were to sole proprietors and that's just from the women and minority owned businesses? Yeah, and that's not the grant dollars. Remember, it's the numbers of applications. So how many applications, how many applications over, how many grants overall were given to by ACCD and tax? Is that the 3,300 or something? It's the thir yeah, it's the 3,500. 3,500. So 20% of those did reach sole proprietors in the, um, the minority of women. In those sectors. Let me ask a question, if I may, uh, John. Sure. Uh, with, with, with respect to the uh, sole proprietor issue, uh, let's take a situation in which a person is a sole owner of an S corporation and the only W-2 employee of that corporation uh, and is not a minority and is not a woman, a woman. So obviously they wouldn't be eligible under that category, but there was some restriction, as I recall, that restricted uh, uh, the, the ability to participate uh, in which it said essentially there wasn't a restriction of at least one non-owner employee that was yeah. dropped zero employees for women and minorities. Uh, what if, how, do, how does this whole program affect that employee, that particular situation? Yeah, so to, as Secretary Curley alluded um, in the beginning, you know, we, we learned as we went, right? You did give us discretion to, to organize this and the statute said uh, at least one employee and um, we started out this by saying, okay, you needed one non-owner employee because we didn't want to differentiate between sole props and people who registered as escorts. But soon thereafter, we changed it. And so we allowed those who have S Corp or C Corp and they have themselves as a W-2 employee, they are permitted to apply, but they would show up under the one to four category, not the sole proprietors because technically they are a one employee operation and they themselves are the employee. But they were there was a subsequent change, but at the yes. point that change occurred, this is a first come first serve program. Was the money largely expired by the time they were eligible to apply? No, not at all. They, um, so what happened when we made the change is we went through the system. The system had um, a number of people who had been previously deemed ineligible or denied, and we went into the system and changed that status to incomplete, which meant that they were allowed then to upload a W-2 or some sort of proof that they indeed were the employee. And so those were tended to, because again, that came out of the general pool. It wasn't that separate set aside that had such a small you know, portion of money. I see. Thank you. And so then- Oh, go ahead. Um, a comment I have as I look at this is um, there's a lot of uh, criticism or um, concern expressed for the people that were not covered. And you're going to address that as, as we go on. Have you done any outreach or have you started hearing from anybody in the form of appreciation for what has been put out on the street and how it's been helped people. And um, have, I mean, it seems like we're putting out a lot of money between the state and the feds to help business to survive. Do we have any, are we keeping any catalog or trying to generate any success stories? Yeah, we are. Um, there are people who are totally appreciative and they've sent emails to us and we, um, I think through our communications team will 
um, be able to present some very positive stories. Um, to be honest, uh, we've been kind of buried with this, so I haven't. We haven't really kind of promoted. You know, here's all the help that's gone out. We're also sensitive to the fact that this is for many of them a mere portion of what they need to survive. So we don't want to claim any type of victory um, at this juncture. But yes, there are people who are clearly appreciative and. Again, we all are. We all seem to tend to go and analyze the gaps and make sure we fix those holes, and that's what we're all here to do. But yes, indeed, uh, I, I definitely know that this has helped. Um, we, people have told us so. Okay. Even people who have have crit criticized us, they start their email with, "You know, you're doing a great job," but you know, or they'll yeah. say, "You know, th this is." not helping me, but, you know, thank you for all that you're trying to do. So I, I think overall, it's been a very positive experience for all of us and all of us that are, all the people that are helping on this, on this um, journey. Okay. Joan, um, I've heard those same comments that, you know, people are very appreciative, appreciative, but I'm also still hearing people who are concerned that um, with the first come first serve, model that we're using uh, because they feel as if they're being left out. So is that going to be with the next rollout? Will that be considered? I mean, will we, will there be time to compare what's been put out and the businesses that are re requesting and will they, um, will those businesses that seem to have moved ahead but still qualify because of the requirements that we put in, um, will they kind of be second tier to the people that haven't gotten anything yet. Yeah, no, we recognize that, you know, there sort of were three choices of how we could implement this. First come, first serve was one, the other was a lottery, and the other was to put a date certain and assess all the demand and then distribute based on a pro rata share. So like New Hampshire did something like that where you know, they had a pot of money, they did a pre-app, they found out the total amount of the demand and it ended up being where the people got 17%. The percentage pro rata was like 17% because of that demand. And we felt like that would be unfair to folks. Um, so yeah, we recognize there are gaps. We, we're not saying it's the be all end all. We are open to other avenues. I think each of them have their drawbacks. So. Um, I think that's the nature of coming back to assess the gaps and figure out how to do this. We, we should analyze that and talk about the best way to do it. I mean, you know, first come first serve has not been a problem so far, but um, as we announced the supplemental grant uh, last week for, for those who already reached the maximum, you know, it will become more of, more of an issue. You know, but I think that there's been ample time for people to apply, to be honest. I mean, it's July 6th. It came out. It's already end of August. Um, we're still getting applications. And the way the statute was written, it was for one month lost from March through August. So we expect there'll be applications in September for to account for the August loss. So we'll see. But clearly, yeah, there are limitations both in the way the statute was written as well as the way the program was designed. and um, we're open. We're open to discussing that. Um, this next slide is just to show the distribution of uh, across sectors. And uh, as you can see, it's no surprise, uh, food services, retail, accommodations are all up at the top in terms of um, the total grant dollars. Um, and, you know, it's, um, we really touch just about every sector. The on the on the right hand side, there's a, a breakdown of the average loss. So what we did is we calculate the average loss for each of those sectors, uh, and you'll see up at the top the um, accommodations being really number one, and and transportation and arts and recreation, and food service uh, showing the significant loss. You know the first slide that I showed. You know we we kind of breeze past it, but most of the funding came out of that 75% loss um, bucket from Act 115. So clearly the people who applied first were the ones most in need. So in that sense, we felt like we were serving 
the people that we set out to serve. Joan, um, what would be useful for me is when I look at the food service, $17 million in grants, um, uh, is there a way to, do you have numbers on, on a further slide as to what those grantees um, receipts were? Um, uh, I'm just trying to figure out how much help this 17 million reflects. I know we did 10% of, of their receipts um, uh, up to $50,000, but I still don't have any idea whether we're, we're giving 1% of their receipts or 20% of their receipts. How big of a help is this? And when I go back to the slide earlier that the grants generally represent only half of what they might have got from the federal government, I'm just trying to understand how much help these individual businesses have gotten relative to their um, need. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be important as we look at uh, your plan for additional monies going out. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I don't have a slide particularly for that, but I think if you're, what you're getting at is what, what percentage of revenues does this really represent? And even though we paid 10% of revenue, there were plenty of people who um, reached the maximum 50,000. So obviously it's gonna represent a much smaller percentage of revenue for them. So it, it's hard to answer that question at this juncture. I think for people who, um, who have smaller amount of fixed expenses, obviously this is going to be much more impactful for them. And for those where this represented a tiny percentage of their revenue, this may not have helped them as much. Now the overlay, you, you can't really come to any sort of strict conclusions. You'd have to look at that particular business's overhead and whether or not they got back to work in May, you know, were able to do something. But the food accommodation services and hospitality and to some extent transportation for sure um, are still, and just based on our kind of, we at ACCD, we had a two-step review process. So we had reviewers and approvers looking through each and every one of these applications. And it was clear that those were the most damaged sectors, which is why we came up with this supplemental plan to pay additional funds to them. Uh, I don't know if that answered it enough, but. Uh, it, it helps. Uh, I'm gonna have to, I would like to dig a little deeper, but um, let me just understand, and I hope the committee can understand, how did you, for people who didn't reach the maximum, how did you calculate their grant award? Let's say you had a dry cleaner business that came to you that suffered a loss uh, that qualified for the program. The next step is to determine what their, and, and um, I guess I'm not, I try to find a business that's outside of uh, the tax department, but in your department, how did you determine, right. how did you determine the size of the grant? So in both, uh, in both the tax department and ACCD, we had a standard uh, grant calculation. The grant calculation was 10% of 2019 revenues with a maximum award of fifty thousand dollars, so, so that the, was standard across the board. Okay. Um, the tax was able to calculate that by going through the tax receipts, but you had to go look at tax returns. Yes. So what we did? Right. Yes, we we had to the the applicant filled in information about their annual revenue. They filled an okay. application about the month of the loss. They filled in that particular month revenue in 2020 and that particular month revenue in 2019. And they had to upload profit and loss statements and tax returns and the reviewers would go through that documentation. Okay, thank you. Senator, if I may, um, I think I, I see where you're, uh, one of the places you're trying to get to is, um, you know, when we set the, the grant cap at the 50,000, for example, in, you know, we, we first, sent grant awards out. If you were a uh, $500,000 a year business, 
you received 50,000. If you were a $5 million a year business, you received 50,000. And that, that 50,000 was supposed to represent two or maybe three months of your fixed costs. But if you look at those two businesses, their fixed costs are arguably going to be significantly different. And so if you're the $5 million business, you received an award amount that was closer to a percent whereas the $500,000 a year gross revenue business received 10%. And that was why we ultimately lifted that um, grant award cap because we were trying to make it a little bit more equitable and it still is, is imperfect. But I'm wondering if it would be helpful to you if we ran a report that maybe showed the, um, of, of all those eligible, what the total uh, gross revenue was and looked at what the total awards was and maybe it'll give us a better percentage so you can really see what the grant award amount is. Is that the number you're trying to drive at? It is and I'm trying to drive at the, the, the question you just sort of phrased is uh, very early on, I know I wrote to the department, I said, I really think this is an, the $50,000 cap is yeah. inequitable for the bigger businesses. And uh, isn't there a way to do this better? And you're coming up with a way to do it better, but you're still doing it in an imperfect way yeah. by having a cap. Um, so um, anyhow, we'll, we'll, we will get to that. So let's, let's move on. Joan. So just, uh, I went back to this slide to show a little bit about what we're talking about, because when you look it's by county, but so if you look at the applications, this 2019 revenue reported give you, gives you a sense of the aggregate revenue reported for the businesses that applied in that county. So for Addison, it was 60 million. And in total, the sum of the awards that went to Addison was 2 million. So it gives you a sense that you see that it's clearly it's not 10%. There are many businesses that went above it. Right. Went above that 500,000 as, as Secretary Curley is referring to. Um, yeah, and so we still have a cap because there's a limitation on, on funding. I mean, we talked about, well, maybe we do no cap. You know what I'm saying? There's always these decision points about how do you make this equitable without running out of funding. So here, here's, here's a legislative executive branch question. Uh, if, if someone, let's say our committee said, we think <coughs> we do this extra money out the door is to have these individual businesses where 50,000 was not enough and apply and uh, give them 30% um, uh, or another 10% of their revenue as opposed to capping it at $150,000. Because we wrote the legislation in a way to give you so much discretion, you're already moving forward on that. You can't make that idea better because you're already, you've already restructured the program to tell people they can apply for up to an extra $100,000. Is that correct? Where, where does the legislature fit into this process? So, um, so on the supplemental award, what we did is we didn't change the ceiling for everybody. And we based this on the learnings of what has happened over the last several months, right? And we know that the most damaged sectors are the ones that need these funds the most. And so we, because this fit within the program guidelines, like setting the cap was within the program guidelines, we raised it for particular sectors. Um, and we've embarked on that, like tax already has received over 700 applications. We have a smaller subset of that because they're doing the lion's share of hospitality. And we have, we have some of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that is an acknowledgement. We, we erred on the side of being much more conservative at the beginning because there's no way of knowing the demand for this. We did models, but you know, there wasn't a hundred percent certainty. And we erred on the side of being conservative so that now we have leftover funds that we could do the supplemental. So the legislature, think I think, comes in to play. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I want to hear what you have to say, go on. But um, in terms of the restaurants that are now eligible for more money, how will you determine how much more money they're eligible for? So what we did is because there's already a system set up, um, it's still the 10% of revenue, except since they got 50,000, let's say it's, 
let's say it's a $2 million operation. Um, so they'd be entitled to 200,000, but they already received 50. So they could receive another 100,000. We set the cap at 150. Got it. Got it. What we did is we notified them. We've sent them in a supplemental award application and they are sending that in. And then we will do the adjustments. They'll have to do attestations, you know, and we'll then be able to send them checks. And we honestly, we, you know, we, we calculated several different ways. If we had no cap, had a $250,000 cap, we did a variety and we tried to come up with the, the one that we thought mm -hmm. would not exhaust the funds and leave people out again. And, um, you know, the uptake, the interest in this has been nearly a hundred percent. So it's showing us that people are, and we did give them a calculator to help them understand where they might be in a duplication situation, duplication of fund situation, and yet they're still applying for the full amount. So it just tells us that the need continues to be out there. Got it. Do, what, what, in the, the bills we passed in June, uh, I think we gave you discretion to factor in any other funds they may have received, whether it's EIDL or PPP. Right. And I know you have listed some of that money here. Did you do anything with that or you disregarded the fact that they might have had help from other sources? Yeah, we did not. We made the decision not to subtract it because of the fact that this is an ongoing crisis. There'd be no way of knowing that they were currently in a duplication of benefit situation. So we thought list it. So we have the in information. Um, and you know, we warn about duplication of benefit and we have the applicant attest that, you know, that if there is a duplication of benefit found, they would have to return the funds. What would a duplication so, of be? So it would be if ultimately they received assistance more uh, than what their loss was. And we feel that risk is low in the hospitality industry because of the fact that they're still operating at very, very limited capacity. However, we wanted to warn and we wanted to give worksheets so that they could do that calculation. Did, if we were, uh, yeah. I, I remember that we had some disclosure transparency in our bill that said all the grantees had to be listed somewhere uh, and the amount that they received, is that correct? Yes, and that's on our website. In the beginning of the report, there's a link to our website where we've listed both the ACCD recipients as well as the tax recipients. And does that also include the federal assistance they received? No, it's just the amount of the state grant. It's but, the name of the business and the state grant. But given the, given the fact that you have that information, it is available and is it public knowledge? Uh, that's a good question. You have it, you have I, yeah. It in total. Yeah, we have it in total. Uh, can we disclose it individually? I don't know the answer to that. I think did the Fed. I think the Feds actually did end up disclosing that. So yes, I think they did. Just, yeah, I okay. think they did. So okay. I mean, if thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. So may may I just say something? You know, as I look at this data. Joan and Lindsay, it's, 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 it's wonderful. And I would say that one of the um, benefits of this is that this is, we are going to have a much clearer picture of, of, of this, uh, of all these businesses that, uh, and by sector, I mean, it, this is just, um, mm, I, I, I'm just impressed by how much additional data we now have making decisions going forward about a whole host of things. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm impressed by how much more information we have here in terms of identifying both sectors and impact, different types of impacts, different, anyway, it's, it's, uh, I'm very impressed by how, by, you know, I don't know, by how much more we, we know and how fuller the picture is. For sure. And you know, Joan is too humble to share this with you, but but I'm not afraid to tell you that Joan has Joan and the team have worked around the clock 
and they have learned so much about Vermont employers and uh, <laughs> we do have a lot more information. And so um, hopefully we yeah. can continue to really help people. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, I just see it being useful as we go into the future in so many different ways. So this is, uh, this is, this is good. Thanks. Thank you for this work, Joan. <laughs> You're welcome. And you know what we, so we had tremendous help that I just need to say public, public shout out to Department of Finance Regulation. They've lent us their people. Um, you know, we've had examiners uh, examining applications. I mean, there's been quite a lot of due diligence and we've had uh, Vita and uh, many people from ACCD. So it's been an all hands on deck. And I don't know if Ted said it yesterday. I know he said in the other committee, we've all kind of redesigned our jobs and, you know, we've got the executive director of VEPSI is the head of our kind of review team. And everyone's been just lending a hand and it's been, it's, it's been great. And we have a lot more work to do. So thanks. Yeah, no, it's interesting. So um, I think that's the bulk of it. I mean, we've gone on to more slicing and dicing of data. Um, you got the sector data, but um, I, I guess this, you know, I thought that this would kind of lay the context for, you know, why we have this next group of asks. And did you want to focus on that now or tell me? Yes, that would be great. Right, so as uh, Secretary alluded to, I think, um, you know, there are people who had like 40% loss and they weren't covered by this, but they're still suffering intently. So covering folks who had a 30 to 50% loss would be um, a useful next move, we think. And when we did some modeling with tax department to find out just at least in the hospitality arena, how many people that would impact, it was like 700 businesses. So we, we do think that that move would, would be helpful, um, but we would make the move to, I think, look at it for a three month loss. Like, and again, I think the hospitality and, and restaurant sector has no problem showing that since it's been months, since there's been a, a, a true, true seasonal revenue that they're, that they're accustomed to. So that, that is one big change. So um, let me ask you a question on that. I agree with the three month loss. Um, it seems like somebody could have a 40% loss in one month and be level for the rest of the year. So their loss would be somewhat minimal. And given that we're basing the grants on receipts of 10%, um, they could wind up getting more money than uh, their losses indicate. Um, so uh, have you started that change already where somebody who has had a 30% uh, loss over th three months time, uh, they're now applying and expecting a grant? No, we cannot. So, we, so we've made all the changes we think we can make within the current statute, right? Like we, we changed the owner employee segment. We did a supplemental award. You know, we're in the midst of doing a supplemental award. I think that's all we can do. The rest is by statute, right? The statute had 50% loss. So we, we cannot take those applications yet, but that's what we would want to change is change that to 30% for three months, as an example. Right now, we don't have that ability to do that. So is it three, a three any three continuous months from when to when? Um, God, I'm forgetting what we put in the proposed legislation. I think it's, um, I think it is any three months from March through December, I, I believe. Okay. And then the other thing is this sole prop. Do we want to open that up to sole props? Right now, the statute says you need at least one Vermont employee. So do we wanna change that? That was the other kind of gaping hole. I mean, as soon as it became, people were aware that we allowed sole props with zero employees, 
that were women or minority owned, but we didn't allow that for anybody else, that raised a big flag, like, you know, it's not fair to those who do not fall into that category. So we want to change that and allow um, all cell props in. So I, I remember we asked this question repeatedly when we were going through and the answer came back consistently that we feel that there are maybe 40, 30 to 40,000 businesses that would fall into this category. And we felt that it was just a question of it would dilute the benefits for everybody else too much. And I think there was also the comment that they might be eligible for PPP and they might be eligible for PUA. Uh, can you comment on those three things? At this sure, point? I mean, all of that, all of that is true. Um, I think, again, when we go back to analyze the decisions that we made at the time were probably the most prudent at the time because there was no way to assess the total demand. There was no way to assess our capacity to do this. And so they were made for the right reasons. And if we had to prioritize businesses that at least created a livelihood for people other than themselves, perhaps that's a good priority. However, now that we're at this for a couple of months, you know, um, many people have received grants. We're bumping it up for those that are most damaged sectors. The question is, what about the people who didn't even have a shot? Well, and even though everything that you said is true, you know, yep, they were eligible for all of that. Um, it, it's just an open question about whether or not we think it's uh, fair and equitable. Well, the question also is how much is how much is this policy change going to cost? How much money do you have? And what I, I'm struggling with the need if most of the folks were getting uh, PUA benefits plus $600 a week. Well, um, do, do we uh, actually know? Uh, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question, Mike. Do we know asking. how many of the sole, sorry, do you know, do we actually know how many of the sole proprietors got PPP and or PUA? I mean, one assumes a, a large percent, but uh, do we actually, Joan, in your in the applications, was that picture clearer? Not really. You know, so props are a big wild card. It's really it's really hard to assess just because like they don't have employees, so we don't always see that. I check with Department of Labor, and not everybody was el even if they were eligible for a PUA, they ended up not getting it because of one reason or another. So it's really really hard to tell. However. Um, we have heard from, for example, lodging properties that are technically higher contractors or, you know, you know, it's just, it's, they're, they're accustomed to a certain level of revenue that PUA is just not cutting it, right? So um, in terms of cost, because these end up being smaller operations, I think the 23 million that we are asking for would help, would, would, would help, um, figure that out. I mean, here's another example. Uh, CDBG had a program that Commissioner Hanford uh, worked through BDCC and Two Rivers, right? It was a sole prop stabilization program. We thought for sure it'd be oversubscribed. In fact, only 300, a little over 300 people applied. So it's a, it's a wild card. Like we know that there's like 30,000 or so, but does everyone apply for it? No, not necessarily. And the well, interesting thing about the sole prop was that people complained that it was a lottery and it felt like it was unfair, but it ended up where I think everybody who applied got something. I'm maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe it's not everybody. I'll let Josh talk to that, but you know, a fair amount were able to receive it. So I think making the facility available, um, you know, would go a long way in terms of being a fair, a fair playing field, you know, would there not be a way to construct the application or approval process in such a way that takes into account other benefits that that individual receives so as to ensure that what we do is at least equitable? Yeah, I think we could do that. I think we can. I just, one of the things yeah. I want to mention, and obviously, Senator Brock, you know this as well as anybody, but um, there are people who are in a corporation who were able to draw on the PUA 
but also were eligible for these grants. Mm -hmm. We have sole proprietors that may or may not have received the PUA that were not eligible for these grants. So there's an inequity right there. And I think that was one of the things that, as Joan mentioned earlier, when the women in minority owned businesses, sole proprietors were applying. I mean, they were so grateful and so relieved to have this money. And I think it just really highlighted to us the need to try to find a path forward for the other sole props who are, who are um, maybe getting personal income through the PA, PUA, but not able to cover their fixed expenses that are related to the, the business that they, the service they provide. So um, just, you know, for what it's worth, I, I think in the beginning, I, I was back and forth on it, but it, I, it really grew strong on me and I, it's not an easy lift for us. Um, and it's hard to quantify the amount that we would need to do this, but I think we, we are feeling in our hearts that there's a lot of need there. Is it, tw is it $23 million just for the sole proprietor, or is it supposed to go for no. other things? Too? It, yeah, it's for all of the things you it, propose. Yeah, it'll cover it'll cover the thirty percent um, or more loss for three months, the sole props, and there was another group that we left out, which is the new businesses, people who started their business like in September of twenty nineteen but yet were closed in March and they had no recourse. They had no ability to apply for our grant because our grant, you needed to show a loss from March through August um, of this year as compared to last year. And if they weren't in existence, it was an impossibility for them. Right. So those are primarily the, the groups, you know. Um, well, and nonprofits. The right. So nonprofits, we did we did issue grants to nonprofits, but the nonprofit um, calculation was a little bit different because in H966, I believe the Arts Council set aside um, required that we don't include grants and donations. I think that was the, how the language was. So because we weren't going to include grants and donations on the Arts Council nonprofits, we thought, again, to be equitable, that we would treat all nonprofits in that same regard. Um, and then there were some nonprofits who did not have uh, what's called program service revenue. Um, and so they were left out. So, right. yeah, so how do we, how would we fix that, right? How would we be able to, um, to help them? Right, and I, I, I think we need to, because we were all so focused on what, people couldn't physically do anymore. I mean, we were very right. focused on nonprofits yeah. that had people going to them rather than nonprofits that were serving and didn't have entrance fee. So, I mean, you know, so it, I, I think we definitely need to address that. I mean, certainly all of us have had nonprofits uh, that we've been working with uh, since the end of our first part of the session. Right. Okay, so can we, can we talk about the the even newer businesses a little bit? What you sure. Can... So, um, sorry, did you have a specific question? Or you want me to just? Uh, what, what, what could you just talk about what you're proposing there? Right. So, um, on the new businesses, instead of them comparing it to the prior year, it would be uh, a loss proven. Uh, any month since, I believe it's since January. I don't have the language in front of me, but I think it was any month from January um, through present to show that there was a loss. And that we would kind of project the annualization of their... Oops, I'm not sure I'm following. So you look back instead of having to show a loss from March to October or whatever it was, where they may not have even been in business in 2019. What's the time period you're gonna look at now? I believe it, the, oh, go ahead, Ted, you have it in front of you. Uh, so the, the, way we the, language, Deputy, Deputy Secretary, uh, the way we drafted the language was uh, to say that you could compare it to February or January. So let's say in March, you had a 30% downturn from February, uh, that would qualify you for the grant. Or let's say it was June that it happened and you know you had a, you had a, a normal May 
and June went down. There's really no way to to show a annualized loss. So you have to at least do a good faith effort to show the loss. And, you know, I, I think of the two or three that have contacted me, a new hotel opened here in Williston. Uh, that hotel opened February 1st. Uh, even they could show that they had a loss from February 15th to March 15th. So they that's the kind of test that I put on it and say, okay, that makes some sense. There's still going to be some that might not be able to show a month to month loss. If you opened February 14th uh, and you're, a, you know, a restaurant, mm -hmm. you had no real revenue from February 14th to March 14th because you're brand new. It, we're still not going to be able to capture that, but I think this would capture most of the new businesses we're talking about. Right. So you can show a, any revenue from January or February in 2020, and then you compare that to a lesser revenue amount in any month since, and, and mm -hmm. it went down by 30%, you qualify? That's the proposal. Yep. Okay. Okay. And and do we have a notion, uh, Ted and Joan, of how many businesses that actually is? Just the people who came to us. I suppose we could always do a search of who was newly formed, but um, we don't think it's a lot. We think it's enough. I mean, we've been contacted by enough of them, at least 20, I would say. And again, remember a lot of the folks that are reaching out to us um, their, while their in-person operations have been permitted to reopen, they may be at 25%, for example. So again, it's, it, it's our restrictions that are continuing to cause, you know, strain mm -hmm. for them. So it's, it's not that hard to determine, you know, that there is a real impact with those. So I, I guess I'd ask the same question about the nonprofits. Do we, I mean, I know in my neck of the woods, how many nonprofits have been in touch, but how many nonprofits? So if you have about 20 new businesses that weren't able to be uh, awarded a grant, how many nonprofits roughly have, have, have applied or have you worked with that haven't been able to receive a grant? Well, actually there've been very few that have been denied. I think the nonprofit critique is that we've, uh, we've awarded them, but it's not at their full revenue figure. And I don't have the number off the top of my head. It's not in this report. I can get that number. But we served many nonprofits, but they we base their award on the program service revenue. We subtracted out grants and, right, and right. donations. So they got a lesser amount. Um, right. And there were a few that were denied, but but probably have nothing to do with the, the revenue. Or they had no program service revenue. Like there are some that just live off of grants and donations and were unable to provide their services and it felt unfair that we couldn't give them a grant. So we'd like to fix that. We, we don't think that's the majority. However, if we do fix it for um, a few, I could imagine everyone who got a lesser amount would want additional uh, funds. So well, I, I don't know what the original intent was about excluding grants and donations, but... Um, I, I think that's, want, yeah. that was our mistake uh, because I think we were thinking, you know, we were thinking attendance rather than uh, than the whole picture. I, I I think that was our bad on that one. But well, I, I think, think it made, it made some sense. I mean, it did make right. sense because it was sort of like when you think about it, the business end of the nonprofit was was you know um, sort of hampered, you know, by the closure. So. Yep. I agree, but with such a significant percent of our businesses in Vermont being nonprofits, this is, you know, obviously this is something we would want to mm -hmm. fix. I also think that I'm sure you've all been contacted by the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And yep. What a perfect example of just something you could never really foresee where, you know, their loss has happened in a triple net lease. Well, there are a lot of nonprofits that have these crazy relationships with other nonprofits and it doesn't show up on a balance sheet the way a typical business would. So I think we have to give a little bit of uh, faith and credit that these folks are asking for funding they really need. And we set up oh. a system that does it does our best. And I think that that would be it. Let's just treat them the same way. 10% of their total revenue. Yeah. Um, 
it's it should work. I, I agree. Uh, so I want to before we move on to the consumer stimulus and marketing and I think uh, maybe that's different witnesses too. But um, uh, Lindsay, I and Joan, I would hope you could get us uh, sort of a one pager uh, on your thinking. You said you went, you, you did look carefully uh, at the sole proprietor issue and whether there should be any consideration of other assistance people have gotten. You know, the elephant in the room here, and we're uh, practically, I think, <coughs> practically your biggest supporters for spending these surplus dollars on uh, economic development. However, there's a lot of people in the legislature who want to spend it on education. And um, uh, it's harder to defend these proposals if there's not numbers or detail as to why these programs aren't, why these folks aren't already getting additional help that could carry them forward and somehow fine tune this a little better so that more money is made available to other needs. So I would like to, not now, but I would like to get something in writing with some number justification that you could look into to show us that um, these sole proprietor people haven't already gotten the help that they need to get through. Sounds okay. Um, Michael, before we go on, can I just ask something about the hospitality sector? Um, we've been contacted several times by the tent people. Are they included in the hospitality sector? Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you. Yes, anybody who's like sort of event affiliated uh, could come in for the supplemental. Okay, thank you. So that supplemental though, again, is, is moving forward and you don't need any legislation or tweaks to the existing law to lift the cap to those particular groups. Correct. Yeah. And you and, and that I understand, I remember that that was a conscious decision on our part to let you decide what the cap would be. Did we give you the authority to treat different uh, groups differently vis-a-vis -vis the cap? I'm not have to look um more clearly, I think it was more, it was generally described as program parameters. Um, okay, well, we'll yeah. be looking at that as well and have our council look at that. Um, okay. So let's move on to, um, I guess the consumer stimulus, would that be in your neck of the woods or would that be Heather? Heather. Okay. Well, don't leave us if you can stay with us, Joan, but let's I'll stay. Yeah. I'll stay. Let, let's, let's listen to Heather talk about the expansion of the consumer stimulus. Mr. Chairman, if I could, I, I hate to suggest a different approach, but uh, Commissioner Pelham might want to segue that straight into the $50 million ask for the hospitality industry, just because it, it actually is tied to the economic recovery grants and to Senator Hooker's question. That'd be okay if we started there? It would be, but I thought we had already talked about it. Um, is this, th th this is not, this is different than, okay, yeah. this, this is different it's than different. raising the cap to $150,000 for the hospitality section? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. like another, it's another reinforcement, if you will. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's then on let's the second. Do, let's do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, for that suggestion. So, Heather, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Good morning. Happy to be here. And I will rely on both Ted and Joan for this portion as well. But it's just, you know, in terms of thinking about the unmet need that is still out there, specifically in the lodging and hospitality sector. 
um, as much as we have learned, as we've talked about, that you know there are still some gaps, and we know that the what the lodging and hospitality sector is facing is this unprecedented ongoing loss. So the types of uh, relief we've been able to offer so far, as we've discussed, have been based on either a one month loss of revenue that the attempt there was to cover fixed costs for a certain period of time. In the lodging and hospitality industry, those losses are continuing and we know that they will continue through the fall and into the winter um, based on the travel restrictions and, and all the other limitations that the sector is facing. So the $50 million proposal is an acknowledgement that the, this sector in particular is far from out of the woods. Um, what can we do to make sure that they are able to survive um, to preserve that infrastructure um, when we do get on the other side of this, you know, hopefully someday that those businesses are still able to provide the, the economic engine that they, they provide to the state. Um, so this $50 million would be for, you know, this is where we have a little bit more flexibility um, with your help to figure out what exactly is, is the right type of assistance. But for instance, you know, in all the talks so far, the award amount has been based on revenue. Um, it hasn't been based on the, the fixed cost specifically. So could there be an opportunity for, to cover those businesses that let's say um, would not be eligible for the supplemental award due to the amounts of the revenue. So they've already received 10% of their revenue, but that that amount, because they're a smaller business doesn't come anywhere close to either meeting the unmet need of their lost revenue or to be able to maintain them through the next six months. Uh, so that's really the intention of what this additional funding would cover. Uh, we also um, were proposing a set aside for ski areas um, in terms of an acknowledgement of the types of accommodations that they will have to make to be able to provide an experience um, that is as contactless as possible um, so that we can still bring visitors to the state as safely as we can, again, knowing how much that sector provides in terms of, of economic activity and acknowledgement of the, um, the additional investments that they will need to make in infrastructure based on the, the COVID crisis. Um, is there language floating around now on this particular program? Yes, it's included in the package um, that just sent to you yesterday. It's very simple. The idea is to use the existing emergency economic recovery grant program to distribute this funding. But as Heather said, potentially adding a new layer of uh, a new formula, a new formula for the grant amount so that the business that received the $50,000 grant or the $40,000 grant could get another grant. Um, you have to, but, it, you know, but it, it's, it's in addition to the new cap they could also theoretically, some of them could qualify for up to $100,000 more on, based upon their revenue. But you're saying now there will be other criteria where they can apply for an additional grant. And in addition to that $100,000 more, they could apply for more money. And forgive me if I didn't catch it all, what would the criteria B, I don't have the new language in front of me yeah. uh, to how they qualify for above and beyond the additional 100,000, how they qualify for more money and how the amount of that money is calculated. I believe the language says they have to demonstrate an additional loss. So right now you have to demonstrate that loss between March and September. This idea would be now demonstrate that loss between September and December. In December. And again, this is primarily, you know, one of the targets here would be for those folks who are not eligible for a supplemental award because they don't make over um, that revenue. They're, you know, that their revenue, because of they don't make more than 10%, they've already gotten 10% of their revenue, but that still doesn't cost their fit. So, excuse me, it still doesn't cover their fixed costs and projected losses. And how do they, how do they demonstrate that? Loss. I know we had a default position, just looked looking at um, loss in revenue before. How do, how will they how will they show additional loss? The proposed language says uh, you'd have to show that quarterly loss 
And so we'd use the same economic recovery grant formula, but you're going to have to demonstrate the new loss. So we're not going to calculate your whole loss. We're not going to make you wait till December and say, we lost another $100,000, so we need another $50,000 grant. We're just going to say, okay, starting in September, you, you'll be able to uh, accumulate and demonstrate that loss to us, which will allow you then to request another grant. That's the, the simplest way that, you know, it's worded now. It can, of course, be changed. Joan, do you have... Yeah, I mean, there are a variety of ways that we can handle it. I mean, one way that you do... What's most challenging about this crisis is that it's not over. So we can make a determination on, like, let's say it's a ski area that projects, you know, if they're operating at a limited capacity, they project their revenue to the end of the year is going to be X. And that X is like half or more than half of what, um, or less than half of what they typically get. But we could do that. We could go through that type of scenario to say the projected loss. Um, we have not gone through that level of detail. I know last time around we, we presented a whole bunch of detail on how we were gonna do all these programs and it got changed anyway. So we thought more broad brush, let's allocate funding to rescue this industry and let's come up with a way. We've got one way that's already in our system. We could change that system. We could do something separate. You know, there are ways that they could show that they still have unmet need. Yeah, so I, I don't think have this language yet on this additional oh. 50 million uh, in what Jess sent us yesterday anyway. I just see language taking us through the consumer stimulus program. I think it's just, three lines, it's very short. So it, and it really just allocates $50 million to this sector for supplemental additional grants. But I'll go back and make sure that didn't get dropped. Sorry, Senator. No, I'm just cruising through it and I'm just not seeing those three lines, but you know. Can you, uh, send, can you, can you send us some thoughts, uh, Heather or Ted or Lindsay as to what some possibilities might be um, that are simple to calculate the loss for the upcoming months. I mean, I'm not going to be, I don't think I'm going to be very receptive if it just says, I don't have that language in front of me, but if it just says to cover additional losses and leave it to the department to on a case by case basis uh, decide what constitutes a loss and how much of that loss you're going to pay. So I'd like to get get some ideas. I mean, you did it in the past based upon 10% of revenue loss over comparable months. Um, I'd like to see some ideas of, I don't want to be one size fits all, but on the other hand, I don't want to give total discretion to the agency to look at an application and say, oh yeah, this we think this uh, company is going to lose money and we're going to give them $30,000. It sounds to me like the language is broad enough at this point that that would be defensible by the agency at this point. And uh, I know for one, I would feel uncomfortable that we don't have some structure to what the size of the grant uh, and the eligibility criteria are for um, the new program. So uh, I, I, we need to work on that language, but it'd be better sooner than later if we got some ideas from you as to what would work for you, for you guys from an administrative perspective. Is that clear? I've lost all, yeah. I've lost all, let me see. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not seeing anybody except for my committee members at this point. So if it's okay, I think we want to Later. go to consumer stimulus. Um, yes. Great. Um, so I would be happy to talk about our proposal for consumer stimulus. Um, so, you know, as, as folks are aware that the Corona relief fund are not available for us to provide uh, money or benefits directly to uh, residents to individuals, um, and yet we know the power of you know spending decisions if those are made locally. 
So this consumer stimulus proposal is, is a way for us to support the local businesses um, that have been so impacted, as well as putting a little bit more, you know, spending power into the pockets of Vermonters uh, so that they receive that benefit and support those businesses at the same time. Um, as you are, you know, as you may recall, we are standing up a, what I would consider a pilot program for consumer stimulus right now, based on the money that we were allocated in June. Um, so of that uh, $2.5 million for marketing, I did just send a, a status report to the, to the committee so that you folks have that as additional background for the activities that we have completed so far. Um, within that original allocation, we put aside 500,000 to do a consumer stimulus program. Uh, we are getting that off the ground right now. Um, it did take some time to do a competitive RFP to find the right vendor for that, to make sure that we were able to use the bulk of those funds directly for uh, consumer stimulus. Um, I know there's been concerns about administrative costs, so it did take some time to stand up who the, the right vendor would be. Um, and we are now um, in the process of enrolling businesses in that program. And we have a expected launch date of September 8th for consumers to register for that program. Uh, the, the broad brush of how that works is that businesses sign up. Um, we're targeting direct outreach to the businesses that have been most affected by this crisis, as we've talked about, lodging, restaurants, retail, uh, health and wellness, entertainment, and uh, attractions to sign up for the program. Businesses enroll, they decide exactly what the, the structure of that gift is gonna be. And then when a consumer decides, hey, I'd really like to be part of this program, um, they are presented with a couple of different options for different stores where they can, you know, or locations where they can use that, where they can use that stimulus uh, based on their interests. Um, as soon as they sign up for the gift, the money goes directly to the business. So there's a real benefit here in that um, the businesses don't have to wait until that consumer walks into the door to receive um, that needed stimulus. They get it as soon as the consumer decides you know, which gift they would like. Um, but then when the consumer does go and redeems that, that gift, you know, evidence has shown that they will spend you know, several times more than that when they're there. Um, so it's, it's, this whole idea is to get the foot traffic into those local businesses to hope that they spend more once they're there and then they then become either new or loyal customers to that business. Um, so uh, there's actually a webinar this afternoon for businesses to enroll um, that will be recorded. So that will be available if, if anyone is interested in seeing a little bit more of the, the fine details of how that will work for merchants. Um, and I'd be happy to send a, a, a link to the recording um, you know, once that is completed, if that's helpful. Um, in terms of how consumers will, you know, will work with this program, we are actually working with the uh, local action support team from the, the Governor's Economic Recovery Task Force to make sure that our outreach to consumers includes um, vulnerable Vermonters and those that have been traditionally underserved so that, you know, this is going to be a first come first serve program, but we want to make sure that in our outreach that we are trying to to use this pilot program to really show how we can get that additional spending power, you know, into the hands of folks who might be might be needing it the most. So that's 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 how the pilot program is going to work. You know, the the reporting that we get out of it is going to to show exactly, you know, how much how much how many businesses were involved, what was the stimulus money, how much more people spent when they went to those businesses. Um, and we can, you know, we're thinking that this is, is a great opportunity to, to look beyond just this pilot program and see how much more that we can do with it. So that's where the proposal comes from to expand the program. There's also the ability um, in the original legislation, as you'll recall, talking about how we could think about this potentially as a mechanism for hazard pay. There's also the opportunity there in terms of expanding the program, you know, we can, the idea is that we want to make this available to as many folks as possible, but if there was a, a you know an, a desire to have it be more targeted, um, these incentives could be specifically uh, provided to hazard pay employees, however that is defined. Um, and they, you know, we also have the ability to to target you know where those incentives can be used, you know, if it's at restaurants or if it's at any other particular sector, you know, as as folks desire. So Heather, can you just Give us a con well, an example um, following the dollar of sure. uh, an individual, a store, how they relate to the state, how they 
get their money, how they qualify. Is it as simple as I walk into a hardware store and um, any particular item or every single purchase in that hardware store is subject to a 10% discount that uh, the consumer pays less and then the employer, uh, the store owner just submits a bill to the state for to, to make up for that 10% discount? So it's, it's actually even a little simpler than that. So a store, a hardware store would, would be able to sign up and, and you know, they create a profile um, so that when they can explain, you know, what their business is, um, there are some exclusions. So, you know, would, this would not be available for alcohol or for, you know, fireworks or, you know, firearms and so forth. But, you know, beyond that, um, the, the businesses sign up, they, they do within their profile that includes the funding mechanism. So there is a link to their, you know, financial records so that when a consumer says, when a consumer is provided with a number of choices and they say, hey, I'd really like to use my $30 at this hardware store, um, that money goes directly to the business. So the, the business doesn't have to, there isn't a separate la layer where the business has to then ask for reimbursement from the state. That all happens um, when they sign up, they are connected to that funding. Um, so as soon as the consumer chooses that gift, that goes directly to their bank account. The consumer has some sort of card that they, they can, use? Yep, they either can do it through an app on their phone um, or for folks you know, who don't have that ability, they can get a paper coupon. So when they come into the store, the merchant will then scan that or otherwise they will basically have a, a portal to this program that they can use to, um, to indicate that the gift has been redeemed. And that's how we can find out if they spent more than the face value of the gift card or if they spent more um, as part of our reporting to know how successful this program was. And you, you've gotten clearance from the powers that be that this money will qualify for CRF funding? Yes, this is going- I know, I know when we were dealing with the hazard pay, we had to go through all these hoops to make sure the employer got the money. And it sounds to me like in the first instance, you're almost giving the money to the gift card or to the individual Vermonter. Well, but the benefit goes directly to the business. So the, you know, the, the Vermonter gets the benefit of the service or the goods, but the money flows directly from the, you know, from the CRF funding to the business. Um, we, we have structured the amount of incentives to target those sectors that have been most affected, you know, uh, and another acknowledgement to make sure that this, uh, this funding is going to those businesses that have been most impacted by the crisis. You, you had said that firearms and alcohol and those things are excluded, but it sounded to me like everybody else was included. So how much targeting really is there? So with, we have the ability to, to uh, distribute the funds by sector and by region. So we have of the, the $425,000 in direct stimulus that will be going out through this pilot program, we've allocated 100 million to lodging, 100 million to restaurants, 100 million to restaurants, excuse me, to retail, uh, 25 to health and wellness, 25 to I make sure I get my math right, 25 to uh, entertainment and attractions, and then another 25 to other. Um, and, in, and the reason why we have that other categories, we did want to be as inclusive as possible. We didn't want to leave businesses out, um, but we also wanted to allocate the funds based on those who you know, really were suffering the most losses based on this crisis. You, you, um, said, mil you said millions, I assume you meant thousands, right? I'm sorry, thousands, yeah. sorry. Okay, I just wanted to be sure, okay. Um, so it's this sounds a little like jump on it is that like what it is going to look like and how are consumers is it all going to be online are consumers going to be expected to go online and choose the businesses that they want to support or the gifts that they want to um, receive like i'm i'm getting yes, they a, will they will they can they can do it online they could also do it on their phone but yes it is an online platform 
Um, what the consumer will do was indicate the, the type of interest that they have, the type of gift they would like to receive. So somebody might like to receive, you know, something at a restaurant, somebody else might like to receive something at a, at a spa or, a, you know, at a, at a hair salon. So they would have the ability to, to pick the kind of gift they would want. And then they would be presented with several options based on the businesses that have signed up. And then they get to just choose whichever, whichever uh, gift they would like. Um, and like I said, at that point, the, the amount of the incentive goes directly to the business. And then the consumer has the next, you know, up, up until the end of December to go ahead and Great. redeem that gift um, and, and get that service. And, and how, do con how do consumers know about it and get in line and or apply? So that's where you know we will be doing um, as much broad outreach as we possibly can, um, and like I said, that's why we're working with the local action team to make sure that since this is a first come first serve program, that you know we get that that outreach to make sure that you know folks who might benefit the most from this program, you know, are really targeted with our outreach so that they can participate. So th that's for the fifty million dollar program. What have you done for the five hundred thousand dollar? Pilot. So this is, this is this, all for the five hundred thousand. Yeah. So how much? How much are you giving out per person on the five hundred thousand? In the five hundred thousand, there'll be a minimum of fifty dollars. Excuse me, a minimum of thirty dollars per recipient. Um, but there is some variation there because we know that to incentivize a larger purchase, for instance, at a lodging facility, you know, they may not be incentivized with a thirty dollar um, gift. And so for, there are some higher amounts that, that customers can receive for those higher ticket items like lodging, but the, the average gift amount and the minimum that folks would get when they signed up would be $30. So how many people are you projecting service, servicing under the uh, pilot program? We're projecting um, 20,000 gifts um, and we're hoping for a minimum of a thousand businesses to be able to sign up. 20,000. <laughs> And then the plus, the plus of this as a pilot is that if, if it, even a part, even if half of the consumer stimulus program goes forward, we have those business relationships already set up. So you've already done some of the, the work uh, getting that transaction, that transaction relationship set up. Exactly. This would be very easy to add additional funding to this program you know, once it's in, in process. Right. How long is the pilot and at what point will you get any statistics back from it? So the pilot, we like I mentioned, we hope to launch it to consumers on September 8th. Um, we, will, we will continue it through the end of December. Um, as soon as folks start choosing gifts, we will have statistics back in terms of you know, where people are choosing. Um, and then as soon as they redeem them, we'll know exactly how much more it created. Um, I would say within the first couple of weeks, you know, we have we have every intention of giving you folks an updated uh, report by October 1st, um, as in, was in the original legislation that would show, you know, that return on investment for this level, um, this level of incentives. Uh, so within the first couple of weeks, we will we will see how many businesses have signed up. We'll see, you know, what folks are choosing, and we'll see, you know, how quickly they're redeeming it. With respect to the exclusions that you have cited, such as alcohol, uh, uh, what are the exclusions? Are there any additional exclusions other than um, those you- I would be happy to send the list. Um, they're, they're based on you know, the exclusions that generally come into play for federal funding. So um, you know, firearms, uh, cannabis, lottery, um, like I said. And those are based on federal rules as opposed to anything that we've established? That's correct. If, for example, you have a person who gets a gift for a restaurant uh, in which you have a meal in which alcohol is served, is the alcohol then deducted from the amount of the gift that's available? That would be how the program works, yes. Okay, thank you. So, and you have a finite amount of money and you're talking about um, a possible 20,000 gifts. People will register for these gifts and then Heather, you said, then we'd know when they redeemed them. So once somebody registers for the gift, you deduct that from the amount so that this could go forward with money left over. You know, because um, possibly we, we assume, you know, we're under the assumption that people will really find this attractive. And so we're not, we're, 
we're not gonna have the problem of having extra funds. Um, but yes, we will be able to see in real time, you know, how many gifts have been chosen and thus, you know, drawing down on the money. Um, so and, and by doing that, then we can make sure that, um, you know, as many businesses benefit as possible. So, you know, for instance, if someone says, you know, I'd love to go out to, to a restaurant and they choose, you know, somebody who, who uh, like a pizza restaurant, you know, the, maybe the first couple of folks might want to choose the same restaurant. Well, then if another, you know, batch of five people also want to go out for pizza, we would present them with a different pizza restaurant for them to go to so that we can balance the fact that as many businesses as possible are able to have their gift um, as the suggestion for folks to choose so that we can make sure that there's an, a dis distribution there that's equitable. Okay, and you talked about starting September 8th and going to the end of December, but if you if it's very popular and you run out of money because people have you know, chosen these gifts, then there's a stop to it. That is, yes, that is correct. This is a, a first come first serve based on the funding that we have so far. But if we pass this right. additional stimulus, it could be added to it. I mean, and and rolled out, you know, in a similar fashion. Exactly. We we have that ability, and so the the fifty million dollars is proposed. You know, the the way we came up with that number is that you know our intention would be to try and reach you know all three hundred households in Vermont, and that would give them an average gift of one hundred and fifty dollars. So that's right. that's where that comes from. And that would be more sending it directly to that household via some method rather than having them apply to get it. We could look at ways to do that, yes. Right. So um, the $500,000, the pilot program, are, are you in any way, it's a first come first serve, but you talked about trying to target it to people in need or hazard pay, as a potential, I, I assume that would apply to the bigger program if you got the money, but uh, what are you doing to target this $500,000 in the pilot program? So the, the targeting that I mentioned is for this pilot program. So we, we're working with the local support action team to make sure that we can reach some of those populations as well as our broad awareness that we normally would do um, in terms of you know using all of our social media channels, using all of our newsletters, all the communication channels that we normally have, you know there has been some media interest in this as well. So you know we think we'll be having some earned media as well as you know the kind of owned efforts that we would do on our own. But in addition to that, we did want to make sure that we were you know strategizing with the local action team to make sure that you know we we reach folks that might not otherwise you know be looking for this news or you know might not be as tuned in or, or otherwise just, you know, we don't wanna, we wanna make sure that as many folks as possible are available yeah. to this opportunity. Yeah, I found, so I don't know if you know what, what you know about this, you mentioned hazard pay, you know, there was an idea that came out of this committee to give almost exactly this kind of idea to people on hazard pay. Uh, and ironically, the number of people on hazard pay, I think is like 16,000, reaching out to 20,000. I think I have to go back and look at the language, but there was a directive to somebody there to study the feasibility of doing exactly this to the hazard pay population. Do you know whether you did that or anybody did that and followed the law? Yeah, we did do that. Um, and we feel like this program would be a perfect way to, to carry forward that intent um, because we have the ability to target it to specific populations. So, you know, whatever the definition, if we, if there was, there could be the existing definition of a, of a frontline hazard employee, or if that was expanded, um, you know, we could target these incentives to those folks. You know, we can also target the types of incentives they receive. Um, so I know in the original legislation, there was talk about restaurants. We can absolutely do that through this program that we have set up. Um, there but, but it sounds to me like, thank you for that. And obviously our committee has an interest and seeing something like that. But it sounds to me like that has to wait for more money and expansion of the program. It's not going to happen with this first $500,000. Correct. 
Correct. For this first $500,000, we really wanted to see the breadth of Vermonters that we could service with this and really understand exactly, you know, the types of services that they would be interested in, be able to, to reach all of those more impacted sectors. So it's, it's really, I think, the learnings from this pilot program that would help us be most successful with that expansion. Uh, we have talked with the folks that are um, implementing the grant program that exists for hazard pay employees. And so we have started those communications in terms of, you know, if we were to able to expand in that direction, understanding how we could work with those businesses that are already implementing the existing grant program um, to make that as, as easy as possible. And Heather, do you have national data or maybe you have local data uh, on when, I mean, you're talking about the, uh, how much people tend to spend when they go into a business additionally to the $30 they have. So is there, is there, is there data on, 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 on how much more people tend to spend once they're in a business? So I would have to look at the specifics, but um, as I recall, it's about three times is the, is the average of what they would spend. And, and that's really the ticket here is that is that we want people to go in, spend that $30, but also spend the $90 they might additionally spend. Exactly. And, and just to, you know, and it's also, so it's, it's that additional spending power and it's really to, you know, incentivize people to, to walk back in the door of that local business is to really think about their purchasing decisions and, and this acknowledgement that, you know, the only way that we're going to come out of this crisis is if we really focus on, on buying local and supporting each other and, and acknowledging that those businesses aren't going to be there if, if we're not, if we're not reinforcing those habits that maybe we used to have um, and we've fallen, you know, out of that habit um, or just to, to reinforce even more. Um, this is a way to just really focus people thinking about, you know, where can I spend my money that it will make the most impact for all of us. Right. And, and I think this committee in particular is very interested in, in how much we can leverage. So $30 leverages X amount more. You know, we see that with our downtown tax credits we care so much about. In so many areas, we want to see an initial seed that leverages much more. So exactly. that's that's part of, I think, what uh, in, interests me about this program is how much more it might leverage in terms of revenue for our local businesses. Exactly. Um, and, the, and the reporting we're going to get is really going to be able to prove that out, which is which is exciting. To right. Be able to have. right. So, Similar uh, to so uh, I'm very interested in this program, especially as it applies to the hazard pay. Um, but I'm curious as to the timing of the pilot pro project versus the $50 million right. you're asking for. Um, when do we get something concrete from the pilot project that we could use to show the value of this? Or do we have to like jump off a cliff with $50 million before we even see any results, then how does that dovetail with the timing of the session and next session? And I mean, the idea is a very creative one and I, I like it, but it, it is gonna cry out for some demonstration from the initial 500,000. And I'm fearful we're not gonna see that in the right timing to get the rest of the legislature to buy into the $50 million. Yeah, I, I do understand. I understand that concern. You know, we have we have stood this up this program as just as quickly as we are able. There's, you know, as with so much of what the agency is trying to accomplish, there's there are details here that are very important for us to get right. Um, that said, you know, we will have um, we will have metrics to see as soon as the, you know very soon after the program goes live. So you know, within the next few weeks, and I would be happy to um, to come back to the committee. You know, just as soon as I am able, once that program gets off the ground within the first week, the first two weeks, um, just give you that that real time data as soon as it comes in. So that would be, you know, uh, you know, let's say by I'd have to I don't want to promise it too too soon, but I would say like you know by the middle of September we should at least have like at least one or two reports on what we've seen so far. Certainly, we can report on the number of businesses who have signed up. Um, right. the, the number of consumers who have signed up that we will have, you know, in just a few weeks. And then in terms of, you know, how quickly consumers redeem those gifts to see that return on investment, that's a little bit out of our control, but we certainly hope that folks will, will activate um, on their gift as, as soon, soon so we can see that. So, 
So I think to go to Michael's question is, and our need to, to be able to demonstrate the success of this quite creative idea is, uh, would it be make any sense to shorten the, the, the time frame so that people would front load it with requests? I mean, particularly if it's a first come first serve, is there any way we can shorten that window so that we front load uh, applications? We can we can look at that to see if we can accelerate the timeline a little bit. We did want to make sure that because it's first come first serve, we just really wanted to have that communications plan in place right. so that you know we were giving folks a, a fair chance at it. Um, okay. And we also wanted to make sure that we had the businesses enrolled so that they knew what they were choosing between and they had a, a breadth of of options. Um, but you know the team we're working with is you know, as with Joan's team and, and everything they've been doing, they're they're really working around the clock on this. So, you know, I definitely hear that timing is of the essence in, their, in, a, in the ability to prove out this program. Um, so if we can accelerate that, we can, we certainly will continue working on that. Great. Okay, so let me do a time check here and people's availability. Uh, it's now 1040. I do think looking at our schedule, we can get everything in. We still need to hear from Heather on marketing um and uh we need to hear from chris on uh downtown development initiatives the agency's proposing and from josh on uh the um the renovating renovated housing uh what was the terminology we used to use um for that program uh and then we have more collins but we do we can eliminate in our in our uh, schedule, the 1130 slot for committee discussion so we can go with those witnesses straight through noon. And I think that should give us enough time. Uh, so, Paul, sorry. Any comments from committee members before we move on to uh, economic development marketing with Heather? Uh, yeah, sorry, I just thought we were, were are we not doing the, um, the joint fiscal asks the, the the downtown better places discussion today are we doing that tomorrow i can't no, that, remember that, that's that's chris cochran we're doing that today okay great terrific yeah. thanks i okay great. uh okay Next Heather, you want, to, you want to finish up with uh the 10 million dollar request sure i'd be happy to um yeah. So this additional request would be to build on the Restart Vermont marketing campaign that we already have in progress right now. So we have been focusing our efforts um, and this is in the, the progress status report that I sent to folks. You know, we've been um, focusing our efforts on the non-quarantine counties right now in Northern New York and Northern New England, um, just to, to make sure that we're talking to folks who can travel here as easily as they can. Um, but we've been spending the summer developing a much larger out-of-state campaign um, with new creative assets that we can share with our, our partners and put out into the market um, that would keep you know, Vermont top of mind for the, the, the fall and the winter season ahead to make sure that, that we are really supporting these businesses that are so desperate for this, this type of revenue. Um, so, you know, in the past, our marketing budgets have been very modest. And with that, you know, we, we look very carefully at every tactic, at, at every target, um, everything we're looking at. You know, given the uh, competition that we see around, you know, our closest neighbors, you know, all the states are in the same position. Um, we are really being outspent in our ability to drive visitors to Vermont. Um, and, it's, and it's not even just for, you know, fall and winter, but anything we can do brand awareness wise to make sure that Vermont is on the radar as folks are making plans either for this fall or beyond um, is again, is crucial to supporting the, the whole tourism infrastructure and the, the whole industry going forward. So with additional investment in that, you know, we can just do things that we never thought we would be able to do in terms of if we're looking at you know, native advertising and, you know, we might target a, a publication like Outside Magazine based on one behavior. Well, now we might be able to look at the New York Times or the Boston Globe. It's just this additional money gives us the, the, the scope and the reach um, that we wouldn't ever able be able to achieve to bring that visitation to the state and that much needed revenue. There's also a component in the new proposal to focus specifically on Vermont products to make sure that that is part of our marketing mix to support our Vermont producers in that way. Um, and also a recognition that, you know, Vermont is 
is well positioned now even more than ever before in terms of relocation. And so how can we make sure that we are continuing to remind folks that Vermont's not, not just a great place to visit, but it's a great place to relocate, you know, especially as we have done so well managing the pandemic. It's, it's um, maybe a bit of a self silver lining in terms of um, another way to think about the demographic crisis that we're facing that hasn't gone away. Um, so we really have an opportunity here to, to just push Vermont as much as we, more than we ever have before, you know, with additional funding to make sure that we think about that brand awareness so that folks are do, thinking about Vermont. Do we have a, a one pager or can you get us one on this particular $10 million? Sure, I would be happy to provide that. Okay, and can you can you explain very brief? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you know the relocated worker and remote worker program is very dear to this committee's uh, interests, and I don't see the consistency with what you just finished up with and cutting that program back. Well, I wouldn't say that the two are uh, in conflict with each other. This is just, you know, as I said, if we are able to make this investment in marketing, um, it's just another way to convince folks that, that Vermont is the place to be. So, you know, incentives are one way. We've certainly talked about that with consumer stimulus and, you know, broad brand awareness marketing is another way to, to make that final. You know, I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree they're not inconsistent. But on one hand, you're asking for a $10 million up. On the other, you're asking for a half a million dollar cut or something right. that counts. And, and, one, one, and quite honestly, living here in Woodstock, one of those things is already happening. It is astonishing how hot the housing market is here and how many more children we have enrolled in our elementary school as a result of the pandemic. I mean, you've got poster people here for this program of relocating but I would agree with Michael's in some ways, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to look at spending more and spending less all in the same breath. <laughs> I think one of the challenges is that I don't believe that a um, you know, remote worker, new worker type incentive would be eligible for CRF funding. Um, right. as to uh, different, different pot of money. Mm -hmm. would be an option. Right, right. It is a different pot of money. I get, we get that. Has, has, anybody looked at whether, I mean, I think that is the answer. They're different part of money. One looks easy, the other looks hard. One looks like free money, the other looks like dear money. Uh, but has anybody looked at um, our remote worker program, relocated worker program, at least through spending through December 30th, why that couldn't be used, uh, why that couldn't come from CRF funds? That's a good question. Because it... I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud a little bit here, but I would think that for CRF funds, you have to show that the money is used to help defray an expense or, or hardship uh, from the COVID um, crisis. Now, the fact that people are moving here and that the real estate market is hot in some areas might be an argument about why you don't need an incentive. Well, you're saying you want money to incentivize people to come here. How well, not mean? incentive, more like a marketing uh, campaign. So, for example, let's make hay out of the fact that we're the safest place in, in the country. Let's make sure that we could capitalize on that by being out front, not just for visitors, but for people who might want to relocate here or for businesses that want to locate their headquarters here or who want a distributed workforce. So it well, is different money happens. and we, we could, you know, get the 10 million spent by December. You know, okay. I think, you know. Why don't, we look, why don't you make an inquiry if you would to the powers that be as to whether there's a creative way to uh, do the incentive grants for relocated workers uh, through December 30th uh, in some fashion to that could qualify for uh, CRF. You know, you may be right. Maybe they'll just come back and say it's a no-no. Uh, I think it's, it seems like very nuanced differences as to where you want to spend. Mm -hmm. I, I would think they 
they either both could get in or they both could fall outside the scope. But anyhow, if you could look into that, I'd appreciate it. So just to keep track of my three asks so far, it's this one, it's uh, um, a question on the sole proprietors uh, in terms of some uh, evidence as to why this is stronger evidence, monetary evidence as to why it's needed. And I also wanted a question answered on, is there a default position in calculating the grant for the uh, um, a mechanism or metrics or how you calculate the size of the grants for the targeted hospitality and tourism grant funds of $50 million other than just folks coming in and saying, I had a loss. What is the size of that loss? I just want to repeat that because sometimes chairs make requests and um, they're not necessarily locked in. I wanted to lock in those three things. Anyhow, uh, was somebody, did I interrupt somebody? I probably did. Joan, were you about, oh no, I, I think it was Senator Brock was about to say something. Yeah, I, I was just uh, going to add something that I know we talked about before we uh, left for our uh, sabbatical. And that was, this, in my judgment, is not a time to be spending money to pay people to move to Vermont. The optics of that to a state in which we have tons of people who are hurting and a limited amount of federal funds available to help them, I think is dreadful. Uh, and if we use any of the COVID money to pay people to move here, and we have people who are small businesses who are standing in line waiting for money that we can't give them, I think is the wrong thing to do. Now, on the other hand, uh, I think what we've said here this morning about marketing to solve our long-term demographic tra uh, uh, problem by taking advantage, if you will, of the pandemic and the, in the impetus of people who want to move here uh, for safety, I think that makes, that makes a lot of sense because we're, we're improving our economic pie in a, in a way that I think would be much more palatable to most of our people. But spending money to pay people to move here, I think, to me, is a non-starter in this environment. Uh, and obvious, obviously, we have a disagreement here. Um, and the, com new. The, the compromise may be is that money was appropriated for this purpose, and it's being taken back. Uh, so at least the money that has been put out there should go forward. Uh, and I think it's an ideal time to supplement what is already happening in terms of our demographics and people coming here uh, with that uh, creative idea. Um, and we should seize on the fact that that has worked and could it work even better now that we have such a great track record, relatively speaking, on COVID. Anyhow, uh, we can save that for committee discussion. Um, where are we? Uh, we're, I think we're done with your areas, Heather. Is that correct? Or do you have something else you'd like to add? I believe that covers it, but you know, I'm okay. happy to, to stay on as long as I can if there are other questions. Okay. Yeah, it's a, a, that's a huge piece of the ask. It's 110 million of the, of the ask. Big. Okay, uh, so well, we have three remaining witnesses, Chris Cochran, Josh Hanford, and Maura Collins. Uh, uh, more is not scheduled till 11.15, so for the next 15 minutes, I could either do Chris, he's on the list first, or Josh. Do you guys have a preference? Doesn't matter to me, Senator. Okay. I, I mean... Then let, let, let's go with the order we have it. Is is Chris with us? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Um, my, my internet connection is bad, and I think we'd planned to have Josh present the downtown stuff. Um, I can speak on the tax credits, um, but I can chime in if it's needed. Okay, so Josh, I, I was thinking of Josh for the um, VHIP stuff uh, and you for the downtown, but if, Josh, why don't you go ahead and do both of those? Well, and, and may I just clarify that there is, there is the immediate need of that the joint fiscal committee would like us to weigh in on the import and how we support some of these requests. So uh, in, in a way we might wanna divide what is an ongoing, what is a, a 
there are sort of three different requests here. One is what a request that's already been made of the Joint Fiscal Committee that they want confirmation or affirmation on. And then there are the additional uh, recovery monies. And then there's the general fund money. So to me, there are three different uh, sort of action needs and timeframes. Is that correct? That, that's correct. I, I think probably the most pressing is just to give you, you know, a, a quick overview of our joint fiscal ask, because um, it is urgent um, yeah. in, in our view. And you know, we can roll in some of the other asks. And I, I wasn't quite prepared to give uh, detail on some of the CRF housing results, um, doing some of that on in house general on Friday, but I can give a high level summary, you know, if, if there's time, but I think um, probably in, in interest of time, want to uh, explain our sort of joint fiscal committee requests of 8.75 million. Um, and it's sort of in three parts. One is to ensure that our downtown organizations have the staff um, to exist, frankly, after this pandemic is over. You know, they're mainly supported by municipalities um, and business sponsorships, and those are pretty hard right now. Um, and so the 23 state uh, designated downtown organizations, we have a, a 1.25 million ask to supplement their, um, their salaries to help um, businesses market plan and permit um, and organize a safe and uh, fall and winter um, season, you know, to help with uh, events and promotions and visitations and increase sales. Um, you know, winter's coming and the uh, businesses in the downtown organizations are very worried about their future. Um, along with, they're sort of like the quarterbacks uh, to ensure that the better places, safer places, money is spent um, most efficiently and is, and is put to good use. Um, the other part of this request is 2.5 million in funding to directly help those businesses, nonprofits and municipalities, you know, purchase the equipment, um, the materials um, and put measures in place to ensure that they're, they can function. Um, right now, summer is, the easiest time for them to adapt. You know, you've seen your successful sort of vibrant downtowns. Many of the merchants move out onto the streets and the sidewalks and pocket parks and, and be creative. That's going to get real hard as the weather gets cold. And, you know, if we want to ensure these places um, don't switch from, you know, the better, safer places we want and, you know, become sad places and, sh and uh, shuttered places, we need to uh, invest and then do it now. We, we really are concerned that if we go through four, six weeks of, of this process um, to get an okay on this, it'll be too late. You know, they'll, these businesses will start rolling up what they have outside and they'll be shutting their doors, you know, maybe for the winter, uh, unfortunately. Um, and so that's what this is about. Um, there's also a 5 million request in here for municipalities. This would include nonprofits. You know, many of our sort of um, uh, civic core has these uh, municipal, whether it be senior centers, libraries, community centers, recreation facilities. We receive requests from the Vermont Association of, of Park and Rec Directors that they need millions of dollars to ensure that, that their rec centers can open safely. We've received requests from libraries. You know, they need to be able to install, um, you know, sanitary systems, um, uh, accessibility features, things that they can welcome people back to, to use these facilities that are part of our civic life um, in a safe way, you know, or our, our, our vibrant downtowns and village centers are just going to be a, 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 sh a sort of um, just a shell of what they we were and what they could be. And, and that's our fear. This is a modest request that you know, we think needs to happen right away to have a chance uh, to be successful. Um, so there is an urgency to it. Um, we do have lots of people reaching out to us um, on this. We've, we've been, you know, hearing from, um, you know, Vermonters, Brattleboro to South Hero, everywhere in between local uh, business leaders, um, volunteers who are really doing everything they can to keep their communities 
you know, vibrant and try to keep them alive. Um, but they're really anxious about the, the, the coming winter, uh, struggling right now and are wondering, you know, how they're going to make it. So, um, this is an effort that we've had a lot of input on. There's a lot of support behind this. I think you'll see, um, you know, organizations such as Preservation Trust of Vermont and League of Cities and Towns, AARP, VNRC, Arts Council, all the 23 downtown organizations, business owners, you know, others all supporting this request with us, as well as the, the other um, sort of general fund budget, well, not really general fund budget, but, um, uh, you know, revenue uh, with our tax credit ask. You know, we just came off a record tax credit round. We had over 50 applications. Last yeah. year, it was only 43. We had to turn down $2 million in unfunded requests from every corner of the state, you know, um, general stores and, and downtown developments, you know, um, all over the place, you know, the, the Shackleton Mill and Bridgewater, um, you know, unfortunately didn't make the cut. It, it's, I can send you a list of, uh, no doubt every one of these projects, you would say, oh, those are great projects. And yet they didn't get funded because the competition was that fierce. The one bright spot in the economy right now, we've looked at the data, is construction. People are building, they're doing home improvements. The sector is up over last year. I forget what the percentage is, but it's over 10%. I mean, this is the one bright spot of the economy that is, in our opinion, gonna pull things along. And so this is not the time to cut these resources. You know, we didn't modify the program at all. We, we talked about delaying the round and giving more time. And we said, you know what, we'll keep the July 1st deadline for the tax credits as it was, see what we get. And we were blown away that it was the you know, record round of all time that people are reinvesting in their properties and doing this work. And some are actually expanding their facilities because they just physically need more space to be able to do their business. And so it's the perfect time to do more of this. Um, it's, every, it's from housing, you know, new housing, rehab housing, you know, business expansion, you know, uh, service and retail sector. It's across the board. Um, so we think these, these two programs work really well together. One is an immediate need to inject, you know, a survival lifeline for the winner so that they can, you know, stay a vibrant place in downtown. And the other is another injection of these tax credits, which you know, are 17 to one leverage, you know, in my opinion, it's one of the best, um, most efficient um, tools we have to, you know, it's a reimbursement program. So these, these private owners and, and nonprofits, they're already doing the work based upon this sort of commitment and leveraging 17%, much of it private funding, and then we're reimbursing them for things, you know, fire code improvements, sprinkler systems, ADA, you know, fire safety has been monitoring the improvement in our, you know, um, sort of the fire prevention in our downtowns over all these years. And the number of fires and damage tracks remarkably well with our investment in these tax credits, because that's where a lot of it goes. You know, we were one of the most unsafe states for fires in our historic buildings 20 years ago. We have changed that graph. And, you know, I have heard, um, um, Director DeRosha, you know, submit a national award for this program because it has actually reduced devastating downtown fires in a way that they can measure. That's sort of a side note, but, you know, the, these two programs, in our opinion, you know, are needed now and they're the right mix of reinvestment to keep our, you know, award-winning downtowns and villages going um, and they need this lifeline to, to keep putting up the fight that they're, they're that they're having um, and, and and that's the field of play for this corona game that we want to win so um, happy to take questions and Chris has a lot more detail than me if, if you want to dive into the details so the 1.3 is general fund uh, foregone revenue foregone revenue that's not too dissimilar to what was in the governor's budget that hasn't been acted on. This is a budget request. Exactly. It was 1.4. We've come down just a little bit, um, but but yes. We, we And in our uh, 256, we had taken it up to 4 million. So 
But the, the first part of your ask is in a response to the Joint Fiscal Committee, the 8.5, and that is out of money that we're still holding. That's out of current CRF uh, money that that the JF that that the state is still holding on to. That you are asking, and you're asking us to, to what write a letter of support for that to JFC. Exactly. Exactly. And and you know our understanding. I haven't had a chance to speak in House Commerce yet, but. They're full supportive of it. You know, they, you know, unanimously passed out this program, you know, before COVID hit to start this in uh, this program anyways. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're hopeful that between all the support. Wait a, wait a second. What do you mean commerce is fully supportive and they, they endorse this program? What program are you talking about? The better places, safer spaces. You know, this was, already something that was in the budget, you know, and proposed as one time for us before COVID hit at a, at a lower amount. Um, and, was, and that what was the amount, what was the amount then? Oh, Chris, do you know what the original <clears throat> request was? I want to say the original request, Chris Cochran from the department was um, 200,000. Um, when CRF hit, the, the request went up to $5 million for better places. Um, it got passed out of House Commerce at a lower amount, passed the House, and then got kind of cut at the, at the very last minute by Senate appropriations. So it's been through the House. It has support there. Um, when we how much chatted did, with- how, how much did the, the house, house pass better places at? I know we rejected the 200,000. How much did- the house passed. I, it was over a million. Okay. And, 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 and that's and just you want a, two and a half million. Two and a half. Correct. Okay. And, 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 and what, I, I think I remember, but can you give us an idea of what this two and a half million dollars and, and was the houses, when the house Passed the. Uh, you said, what did you say? The house passed one million. Or you weren't sure. I believe it's one million. I don't recall. I can. I will check and confirm all this. Okay. And did that was that general fund or was that CRF funds? It was CRF. Okay. And in, in, in the last sort of hour of Senate appropriations discussion, you know, this was was on the table, and it and it was kind of, um, you know a last minute cut that it was, it was viewed that some of this was just going for things like picnic tables outside. And, um, you know, I, I think it wasn't fully understood at, at, at that level, what the ask was here. Um, the, 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 now the, the challenge is even harder. Many of these businesses have scrapped up what they could and adapted to being outside this summer, but that's going to get in harder and harder you know, they're working, what I hear is they're working twice as hard for half the revenue, half the business. And that's going to get worse. Um, you know, they're going to need to move inside in many cases, or they're going to need to adapt and have, you know, more permanent tents with, with heaters and shared spaces and all sorts of, you know, safety and sanitary measures brought inside all, you know, um, at the expense, um, you know, cost to the, to the business that they're not even able to operate at full capacity. So it's why it becomes even more urgent as we go into this coming season. You know, fall is a, is, is usually a, a, you know, dramatic season for our, our businesses that see lots of revenue come in and that's very uncertain right now. And we want to give them every chance to, to be successful. And, you know, we know that cities like Montreal and Quebec city and even Lake Placid, they, they do these outside festivals in the wintertime in a way that still brings people and they can be safe and they can inject, you know, that, that um, spending into the economy. And we think with some modifications and some funding to help our downtown organizations and help the, the main street businesses make modifications, we can do that here in Vermont too. We can invite people out of their homes where they would probably welcome a chance to get out and, and go downtown, spend some money, you know, participate in an event um, only if they feel safe and if they feel, and if the businesses are able to adapt and be open 
Um, that's what we're trying to do here. So Josh, does everybody on the committee have this memo from Lindsey Curley to the Joint Fiscal Committee? I'm not sure our committee has it to, for us. Uh, I'm not sure everybody has it. Does everybody have it? I'm not sure I do. Uh, so I, I think that would be helpful for us because our we're kind of running out of time here because I it, you're asking this for basically for us to support this request quest out of current CRF money that's already been he held for these kinds of purposes. And the JFC is looking to us to affirm this spend and confirm that, uh, you know, to affirm this request is what I understand. So I think it's important for everybody to see this memo. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be cool. helpful. Okay. I, I now, this is Chris. I'm sending it to you now. And I, I just confirmed that um, in the original governor's budget for Better Places back in January was a $250,000 request. The House moved that up to $1 million in equipment grants. That's what passed the House. Right. Right. And equipment. it took on new urgency is, with COVID. Is this, I had viewed Better Places, Safer Spaces as far more broadly than equipment. Are we just talking? about equipment here? No, it, it, it's more broad than that. It is, you know, turning a sidewalk into a, a permanent um, spot for, for businesses to, to expand their stores and offer, you know, what they have to sell outside, um, accommodate for the cold weather, um, you know, a pop-up addition to their restaurant so they can have more seating. Um, uh, but it does include sort of um, safety, equipment if they need to have you know touchless doors or hand sanitizer washing stations all that sort of stuff as well as um you know promotions and uh, event planning to get people to come out in a safe way um it, it's pretty broad right okay what um in terms of the uh this is in your mind this is in no way duplicative of recovery grants that businesses can apply for? Right. I mean, the recovery grants are, you know, making up for their lost revenue, uh, you know, helping them to get through. This is for, you know, funding, future funding to put measures in place so they can, you know, operate um, with a better bottom line. Um, you know, I've heard the same question about the municipal side of this. You know, why isn't the municipal grant program that tax is operating um, going to serve this purpose? Well, that's a reimbursable program for expenses they've already incurred, and it has to be coordinated with FEMA reimbursement. This is for municipalities, you know, and when I say municipalities, many of the libraries and rec centers and others are actually quasi nonprofit or there's some relationship maybe other than a municipality and they would be eligible. This is to actually install these safety measures. Some need a ventilation system, some need you know, um, new uh, sanitary systems in their bathrooms and expanding their bathroom facilities. And so they don't overlap because that other program is meant for reimbursed costs that they're already incurred that have a FEMA component. And these would be um, in, um, adaption, ad adaptations that they're making to these facilities going forward. So they haven't done this work yet. Okay, how about the designated down town organizations is that is that like charlie baker's thing or is that the church street marketplace it's like uh, Montpelier alive um uh the brattleboro they all the 23 designated downtowns they have a at least a half-time staff many have a full-time maybe even an intern in addition to the full-time and and those designated downtown organizations have a relationship with the municipality um, each municipality needs to support them at, at some level, um, you know, whether that's $30,000 a year or, or, or something, they make a contribution um, and they're connected, but they, you know, act independently, have a board, and they sort of, you know, coordinate the needs of the businesses in that downtown district. They, you know, do events, they do collaborative marketing, they do, so those organizations are, like I said, the quarterbacks, and they're under threat right now because you know municipalities don't have extra money to to send to that 
to that organization, that staff, why, and why, a lot why, of their why why aren't these people eligible for our new revised nonprofit recovery grants? Well, they they might be eligible for some of that, but the losses that they experience are so small that that formula is going to be like a couple thousand dollars. You know, when you're only talking about a one month loss of an organization that runs off of $60,000 a year, it's really not enough to more than a, you know, two weeks paycheck or something to, to give them the confidence to sustain and, and plan for this fall and winter. It, it really isn't in, you know, it's tr true that the business sponsorships have dropped off so they could show a loss there. You know, they're not having events, so there's no loss there. But the net sort of the formula we have just doesn't provide enough funding to really, um, you know, uh, ensure that those organizations can do the work necessary um, to prepare for this fall and winter. And this doesn't include the chambers, right, at the moment? This at the moment it doesn't, but you know we have um, our our plan here is you know counties like Grand Isle and Essex that don't have a designated downtown organization, working with um, NBDA or Northwest Planning Commission, the RDCs, RPCs, and the chambers to ensure that those communities have access to this support as well is is our plan. Okay, and the municipal facilities programs. $5 million. Uh, explain that to us again. So what we've been hearing, um, you know, like I said, from the uh, direct, uh, Vermont Association of Park and Rec Directors, um, the libraries, um, and other municipal facilities, civic uh, community centers, senior centers, they all are, you know, mainly located in the heart of the community, in the downtown, in the village. And many of these facilities have not opened back to full capacity and they feel that they can't safely open them unless they have funding to make modifications. Um, you know, some cases they feel like they need uh, better ventilation, especially if it's a rec facility. They feel like they need um, sanitary systems and the bathrooms upgraded and changed. Some, um, you know, ADA work for touchless doors. And so it's basically to um, help them with the financial support needed to make these costly repairs so they can open safely and once again be part of a you know vibrant community and, your, repairs, you know, this, your repairs and renovations i mean it sounds like they need to adapt adaptations so that they can function exactly you know and this is you know five million dollars this isn't like every single community has one facility that this money is going this is going to be competitive we're going to help the most um, pressing issues um, in, the, in the communities that have not been able to do this yet and that these uh, facilities are um, not fully open and, and, and can't be safely open without some additional support. So this would be, you know, competitive and, and targeted to those um, with the most need. Was there, wasn't there some money on the federal level that went directly to municipalities? Yeah. So, so the CRF money, you know, Vermont, um, we all appropriated about $13 million as a tax department program for municipalities. I mentioned that that earlier, but it was for reimbursement. Um, you know, so let's just say they needed to, um, you know, hire more um, staff or, or, or actually pay more overtime for some of their municipal employees, or they needed to do some, uh, you know, purchase PPE, um, those sort of expenses are eligible for reimbursement from that 13 million, but it has to be in coordination with FEMA because FEMA has some reimbursements for these added and necessary um, costs borne by municipalities. And this is sort of completely separate. This is forward looking. This is for things that they haven't done, that they're not eligible for reimbursement because they haven't done these um, repairs. I mean, these modifications, but they will, if someone provides them with some funding so they, they can open these facilities back up and, and be parts of the community again. And the reason that the ask is small is because you know this is some sort of capital improvement work that we only have till December to get done. And so we're gonna target this to those most needed, most ready um, and have the, be you know, the best um, case scenario to, 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 to have the biggest impact. 
I'm not, uh, I'm sorry, Josh, I'm not understanding why they couldn't do this and then through FEMA ask for it as a reimbursable expense. Um, you know, from what I'm hearing is they're just not willing to go out on a limb like that. Some of these type of expenses might not be considered eligible and they'd have to spend it at the risk of they won't get reimbursed. You know, this is going to be granting them money so they can do the work. And plus, they have lots of other costs that they are um, expecting, you know, eligibility. They're, they are eligible for FEMA reimbursement. Um, and these would be projects that are left out of that. But this is all CRF money. Don't they have to qualify under CRF for the money to be released to them? This would all qualify. This is directly eligible, for, you know, impact from COVID. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you can't open your community rec center because... So why, so why, why are they afraid under the FEMA thing that they won't get reimbursed? My understanding is most of those expenses are different type of expenses. They are for staff, overtime, for other accommodations they've made. Um, it could even be for lack of revenue coming in from, you know, if they have a municipal wastewater and a sewer system, those sort of expenses, not to modify their senior center or their recreation facility. Okay. But, you know, you're raising a, 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 a very good point that we don't want to be duplicating any efforts. And, you know, that is a, a standard test for these funds, a duplication of benefit that would be front and center. Um, you know, this small request is just based on the ask that have come to us um, over these last few months saying, there's no help for this for our community. You know, we're not going to be able to open these facilities and provide this, you know, Boys and Girls Club, you know, they have affiliation with some communities. They're expecting to have increased after school care because of the hybrid, you know, uh, school model. And they're like, we can't safely provide this space unless we have money to um, adapt and to, you know, make our facility safer. And so it's those sort of requests that this is based on. Okay. Uh, I would like to, you may have done this already, but I would like you to uh, draft us a, a one page justification on this 9.5 million okay. as to why you need this money today as opposed to a month from now and why it shouldn't take its place with everything else in the budget that has to compete for limited funds. Why this is so absolutely urgent that you need a decision within the next week. Okay? It's, I think 8.75, isn't it? It's 8.75. Yeah. And, and, and I think- I see 9.5 on the joint fiscal committee request on Ted Brady's memo from yesterday. Oh, but anyhow, okay. You, you get the point. Let's, let's move on and um, Josh, we'll do the VHIP thing. I think we'll squeeze you in on Friday if you're available. Uh, but I think we're going to move on to uh, Mora right now. And uh, that's probably all we're going to have time for, unless you have something you'd like to add, Josh or Chris, at this point. I'm all set. Thank you, Senators. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this this is Chris Cochran here. Um, yeah, I think the memo that we sent to Joint Fiscal Committee does explain the urgency, and I just sent it to all the committee members. Um, right. If that's lacking in any way, please let us know. Um, but again, the FEMA reimbursements, from our experience, are incredibly slow. Municipalities are, are understaffed. They do not want to take risks. They need certainty if they're going to make these improvements, that they're going to get the cash flow. Their receipts are down, revenues are down, and this is going to fill a critical gap. It also takes municipalities a to, uh, some time to get stood up. So that's the urgency. And again, winter is coming. We need to be able to prepare for this change of seasons and we need to be able to do everything we can to capture more revenue for our businesses and more revenue for the state. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, is, is Mora? On the line, on the waiting room, or how does that work? I'm here and always. Good to all see right. you all again. Uh, can I jump in, Senator? Yes, you can. I'm trying to find you on my screen here, but. Uh, oh, I see you. Hopefully that'll help. 
Um, Hi, hello, I've missed you all and, um, and hope you enjoyed your long break. I'm Maura Collins with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to um, give a very quick update on the mortgage assistance program that you all um, supported with CRF funds. Um, and, and not just thank you for the opportunity to speak today, but honestly, thank you for the opportunity for picking VHFA to do this important work. I mean that sincerely because I'd like to draw your attention to um, the handout that uh, Mark put up on your committee webpage, if you're able to um, pull it up. Um, you'll see that uh, most of that document is a uh, report that we um, were required to submit to the state, uh, giving an update on the people we've served, which is what I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. But just this morning, um, I added a cover page to it, which are snippets of um, they're excerpts from the applications where people who have applied for this important resource have talked about why they need the money. What was their COVID need? What is their family or employment situation? How has it changed and why is this so critical? And we've had um, over 280 applications and I've given you probably less than a dozen of these excerpts, but it is so compelling to read how great the need is and how important this program is. And so it's been really meaningful work for BHFA staff um, for us to be able to fulfill our mission in the way that um, we've been designed to do by statute. The, um, these, are, these are moving. I mean, these yeah. are great and sadly underscores the fact that we weren't able to give as much money as we wanted to this program. Well, let me speak to that. Um, you'll, you can um, follow along it, with the, the rest of that handout that you'll see, which was my August 10th update. But when I start throwing numbers at you, they're gonna be different because we're two weeks past August 10th. And so I'm gonna give you the latest that I have. Um, right. I'm also going to start with um, the best part, which is the end of the report, where I talk about who we've helped, and then I'm going to jump back to the beginning of my report, which talks about how did we design the program so that um, I can answer any questions about why we did what we did. Um, as I mentioned, we've had over 280 applications, and the median monthly mortgage payment that people owed is just about $1,200. So um, you can, we pay for up to six months of their monthly mortgage liability, um, but most folks are four, five, six or more months uh, delinquent. Uh, over a third of people are five months delinquent and another 25% are six or more months delinquent. So um, some of these delinquencies are longstanding. And while we do know that um, two thirds of folks do have a forbearance agreement, meaning that their lender due to either federal regulations or their mortgage insurer or the lender just decide to offer forbearance. Um, that's great that two thirds have a forbearance agreement because it means that the lender has um, uh, said that folks can skip a few payments. Um, those forbearance agreements have to be paid back and uh, it's modifying the loan terms that could create a, a consistent unaffordability of these mortgages long term. Laura, can, are, I ask you, can I ask you a question yeah. on that? Yep. So was our program designed to help those people who had the forbearance protection or not? Yes, we allowed, one of the design decisions we made was that this could be used for folks with forbearance or without. Um, we chose a batching process as opposed to first come first serve, mainly because um, we're really focused on equity and that it would not be fair. Um, those with the fastest internet who apply on day one um, and are savvy about working these programs may then get assistance that others who may have language barriers, disabilities, uh, slow or no internet might be delayed. So we went with an approach of, um, we took applications from early July. We said till the end of August, but we're um, keeping it open because we haven't spent all the money yet. Um, and we took this, um, 
approach where we prioritize those at greatest risk of foreclosure and who has the lowest income. So I would say that someone without a forbearance agreement would it be at greater risk of foreclosure, but we do allow folks with these forbearance agreements to be eligible. Does a forbearance agreement typically like on the federal program where they were, where forbearance agreements, I guess, were required, um, is that essentially a tolling of the payments so that if somebody had two years left on their mortgage, they'd stop paying for several months and then they'd still have two, two years left on their mortgage so they really wouldn't be any worse off? Uh, no, there are probably as many forms of forbearance agreements as there are loans out there. Um, they, uh, th that can be, and that's what we would love to see across the board, is if all lenders could uh, just tack the extra, let's say I got a six-month forbearance, can you just tack six months onto the end of my loan and my term is now extended? Um, that is ideal, but for most of us who have still 10, 15, 20 some odd years left on our mortgages, that means that that um, investor of the mortgage now has uh, not received payment and is giving an interest-free loan for 20 years until they get those payments that they were expecting. And so what we often see is that forbearance agreements um, are for six or 12 months and then at the end of the, towards the end of the forbearance time, the loan gets modified and the borrower then has to pay back those six or 12 months through some kind of reasonable payment plan. But even a reasonable payment plan may mean that they have one, maybe two years to pay this off, which means that their mortgage payment could be going up by hundreds of dollars a month once the forbearance right. period is over. Right. So there is a real risk of foreclosure even for folks who have forbearance, if they're not able to afford the modified loans. And we set income limits on this program and are working mostly with low income homeowners who would probably not be able to withstand that kind of shock. Right. Okay. So, um, uh, I'm really proud of the fact that so far our applicants have been younger, more racially diverse, with larger household sizes, and more likely to be disabled than the general population. Um, we've intentionally done a lot of work around language access. Um, we've had uh, 75 downloads of a, um, in different languages of our application guide and out of 280 applications. I mean, that's saying something. Um, Seven, 75 different languages? No, 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 I'm sorry. We translated it into um, nine different languages and there were 75 downloads of those various languages um, of nine different languages. Wow. Uh, the regional dispersion of the applications is fairly in line with where we see Vermonters with mortgages. We're a little over um, serving Chittenden, Lamoille, and Wyndham counties, and we're a little lower in Rutland and the Northeast Kingdom. Um, but we're working with the state's homeownership centers, uh, AALV, and the Vermont Center for Independent Living to help um, folks who are interested in this program. And they will sit with someone, help them fill out the application if they don't have access to a computer or internet, they will, um, there's paper applications available or they will sit and, and you know, fill out an application with folks and answer questions. And we've trained all these organizations and then um, we're using a little bit of the funding to reimburse those nonprofits for the assistance that they're providing. And I think that that is proving to be very well worth it looking at who we've had um, come in for the program. I'll fly through some of the eligibility and then take more questions. Um, you all in statute required that we set income limits um, somehow taking into account uh, based on area median income. We were looking for a lot of simplicity with this program because of the tight turnaround. And so uh, we wanted to have one statewide income limit. Um, but knowing that Chittenden County's median incomes are so much higher, we did set a limit for Chittenden County and then a separate limit for the rest of the state, which roughly translates to about 80% of area median income for those areas. But we're only looking at income 
from the last 90 days, because we know that there are many people who may have had moderate good incomes in 2019, but it really, this pandemic has hit everyone. And so it's looking at their recent income uh, that's most important to show if they have a hardship. We initially started the program saying that we could give up to three months of past due mortgage payments. The statute says we could have done six, but we were worried um, that the demand would be higher than uh, the money we had available. And that has not been the case. It, we looked at um, how many lower income mortgaged Vermonters there were. And we, uh, I believe I testified to you all a few months ago saying there could be as many as 4,000 applications coming in. And as you can see from me saying we've helped 280, that has not been the case. Uh, we are still processing um, and doing our due diligence on the applications that we've gotten, but if we were to pay everyone everything they asked for and all the numbers that they gave us turned out to be accurate, we will have spent about $1.8 million of the $5 million on direct program costs. Wow, that's a lot less than you had anticipated. It is, and what we're seeing is, is that each month, of course, it's going up. We didn't wanna create a moral hazard of people not paying their mortgage just to get government money to pay their mortgage. Um, so we do require that someone be at least two months behind on their mortgage before they're eligible. And um, we still believe that that's the right benchmark to set. Um, that being said, as you know, the pandemic unemployment insurance was available through the end of July. And so right. one could imagine that August, September, October, November, you know, we're going to see much greater demand for this program as time goes on. And as you know, we are in a really, um, between a rock and a hard place of knowing that the demand is growing while the time limit of this money ends December 30th. Um, so we did expand the program and say, you know, we'll do six months right off the bat if someone owes six months worth. Um, and, uh, so we, if sticking with that first round of applications from July and August, they're being processed, um, currently, but we have September, um, to sort of process those and we'd make those servicer payments um, by October 1st, and we would include that September payment in it so that those households um, would get the maximum uh, that they're eligible for. But like I said, we are going to keep the program open. We're going to be hitting the ground with more marketing um, and advertising, and um, we expect that demand will continue to come in as each month goes by. Another way that we um, uh, expanded the program was um, that we have allowed um, that there were households we learned uh, some of us uh, escrow our taxes in with our monthly mortgage payment and so if you did that you could get your your principal and interest paid for as well as your insurance and taxes if that's your monthly mortgage payment that you pay your servicer because you escrow that there were people with mortgages who did the right thing in paying their mortgages, despite the fact that they were unemployed or furloughed or whatever, they paid their mortgages, but fell behind on their property taxes. But because they don't escrow their property taxes, that tax bill was not eligible for our program originally. And that wasn't right. You know, if I escrowed my taxes, my tax bill would be covered. But if you didn't escrow your taxes, yours would not be. So we got quick approval when we heard about a specific instance in central Vermont um, where a woman was facing a tax sale um, and uh, really stepped into action. The state was tremendous. They got us approval from their um, uh, the Guide Star consultants and all this within a day or two. We've been able to work with the town and um, make the payment uh, that we that she was the max amount she was eligible for to save that home from tax sale um, before anything happened. And so we've we've opened that program up broadly and we'll be um, promoting that more in September about how um, in that way property tax payments, if you have a mortgage, are eligible. I want to wrap up my comments, even though I have 
so much more to say about um, how great this program's been. I'm happy to answer questions, but one thing I want to pose to you all for your consideration um, is something to consider, which is a limitation of the program that we've discovered that, that gets to this property tax question, which is the way the statute's written, we can give up to six months of your monthly mortgage liability. So in this situation, the property taxes up to the six months of what that mortgage payment is. But what about people who do not have a mortgage on their primary residence, but do pay taxes on their primary residence? Should we expand the program to allow to pay the property tax bill, six months of property taxes um, in that situation where someone does not have a mortgage? If so, it would require a statute language change. Um, and I, there'd be other questions about, well, then where do you set that limit? That is it six months of um, the property tax bill or not? Uh, well, while we all know that CRF funds cannot be used to replace state revenues and taxes in general, the treasury guidance, the reason we were able to get that quick approval on this is because treasury guidance in their Q and A's has a very clear couple sentences that speaks to the fact that if property taxes um, are due and the non-payment of them could lead to the disruption in someone's housing like a foreclosure or eviction, then the payment of past due property taxes is an eligible CRF use. So again, we were able to get the quick approval from GuideStar if someone has a mortgage but we do not currently have approval to do this if someone doesn't have a current mortgage. So what's the interplay more with that and income sensitivity that we already have in place for, uh, for property tax payment? Well, I mean, um, we already provide for some of this through income sensitivity. Absolutely. Um, so therefore someone's property tax bill will be less if they are eligible for income sensitivity. Um, but it doesn't mean it doesn't always go down to nothing. Um, and so some people still have um, property taxes that they owe. Because remember, your property tax sensitivity is based on the assessed value of your home, not on the mortgage that you have on your home. Um, so right, but you're talking about people with no mortgage, where they are, if they are low income, they are probably if they earn less than ninety thousand dollars a year, they're already being income sent. They're already paying not by assessed value, but by their income. Yep. And sometimes some of these applications we've seen are people who um, well, I don't know if it's over ninety thousand, but um, you know sometimes there's people who in twenty nineteen earned um, a good income and and then were furloughed for several months by their employer, and so it's a, a temporary thing. I'm posing the question to you all about if this is of interest to you to expand the program. I, because I, I feel like it's my responsibility to bring it because um, if I came to you and said, I've spent all $5 million, then I wouldn't be talking about expanding the program. Uh, right. You all can decide that seeing how much of the program we've spent so far, do you wanna keep the um, box small and know that more applications are naturally gonna be coming in come September 1st and then come October 1st? or do you wanna expand the box because there's money left on the table and this is one way that we could spend it? Well, as a former Ways and Meany, I, I have to say, I think that that is the, once you go to paying property tax, to me, that's an, a finance issue that, that Senate and House, House Ways and Means and Senate Finance should look at uh, perhaps for people who are income sensitized, being able to look at current income and not your income a year ago. That I think your initial response about this program and about the five million was that it was way too little, and you were quite cross about how little we were able to uh, put to this program. And given the um, reduction of the PUA, and uh, part of me thinks this is already still not a lot of money, and that there may be a bigger demand coming forward, partly also because a lot of these people are not, particularly in the hospitality industry, they are not getting rehired. They are not, they're still not working, even though, as we saw in the UVM st research uh, sort of study, 
income is not as big an issue for Vermonters, but it is in certain sectors. And uh, anyway. Yeah, look back at those uh, excerpts that we started um, my testimony with that tells that story exactly. So um, I, I'm with you, which is why I'm not coming and saying this is something that I'm going to strongly advocate for. And if you don't do this, the sky's going to fall. I wanted to point it out as an opportunity that you all should consider um, that's come through the program that we've discovered. And if this is something you wanted yeah. to look at, I wanted to make sure you knew of this so you could consider it. Um, there are people with no mortgages who have property tax bills who may be at risk of losing their homes due to tax sale. There also may be a whole slew of people who are hurting, but because of pandemic unemployment, haven't been eligible to apply to this program yet and are waiting in the wings and come that September 1st mortgage payment deadline are now gonna flood, I, I don't know. Um, right. I really wish we had longer than December 30th to figure this out, but I know, I believe we share that concern. Yes. And we're hopeful that Congress will get its act together and act on many of these things, extending those deadlines and providing more assistance. Okay. Um, so thank you, Maura. I did have one question circling back to the forbearance question. If you have an applicant who is in a forbearance situation, what are you offering that person presently? What are we offering? Is that what you said? We're offering them the same. Um, uh, it goes up to well, how many months delinquent is that person on their mortgage? They'd have to be two months delinquent. If let's say they were four months delinquent, then we would pay those four months of the monthly mortgage liability. So they're still in their forbearance agreement but that four months has been paid for by this program and maybe their forbearance agreement continues, but it means that when they modify the loan to pay back that forbearance, they don't have to pay for those four months that this program paid for. Or maybe that four months was all they needed. The, between the forbearance, they didn't, um, um, that, that helped them to skip those payments so that that money could go to food and transportation and other costs. And then this program is, is backfilling that mortgage. And so maybe um, that's all they didn't pay and they won't have to modify their loan at all as a result of this. Um, and, and you said two thirds of your applicants are, have forbearance agreement? Yes, which is not surprising when you think that all Freddie, Fannie and FHA mortgages all require, you know, government insured mortgages, um, that, that that's not out of line with what I would have expected. And when we were talking about this program in the spring, we were viewing this program as helping people with forbearance agreement equally to those without forbearance agreements. We talked about it being eligible to both and, but we wanted to prioritize those who are at greatest risk of foreclosure. And I would say that those without a forbearance agreement are by far a greater risk of foreclosure. And so I would, that's why I wanted that batch process so that we could make sure that if there were two more applications than we had money for, we were going to pay the people without forbearance agreements first and then get to those with forbearance agreements because that risk of foreclosure is lower because they have the forbearance agreement. What we've seen is, is that the applications are lower than we thought and we've been able so far to pay um, for July and August, both those with forbearance and non-forbearance. Okay. Okay. Can I just ask, can I sure. just ask about um, the property tax is issue? If we decided that we wanted to expand that because the program hasn't been subscribed to as much as we thought it was going to be. Um, would you still, how would you then um, determine which applications were going to be accepted? Uh, would the mortgages take preference? Would, uh, and then if there's money left over, would there be money for the, the people with their property tax issues? Um, or, you know, I guess because you do a batch process, it sounds as if that's what would happen. Or, or do you determine even 
if it's um, simply the property tax issue that these people are high, at a higher risk of foreclosure? I mean, how would that work? I'd like to say that um, we take a common sense approach, which is just the goal. What I heard clearly from the House and the Senate when this program was created, and I believe it's in the language, is that this is a foreclosure protection program. And we're trying to keep people in their homes and not um, out of their homes during a public health emergency. So I would um, prioritize those at risk of losing their home. And in the case of the, um, the person in central Vermont where a tax sale was going to be uh, in the month of August, you know, we got that approval and got that payment done because um, that household may have been out of a home very quickly. Uh, for a lot of, we're, we're, I don't wanna say we're taking our time, but we are working through these other mortgage um, applications because uh, there, there's a foreclosure moratorium still. And so, you know, a, a tax sale um, was at greater risk than a, a current foreclosure, which takes a long time to get through the courts, even when they're open and fully operational. So um, I don't know if I was close to running out of money and you say, would it be a tax sale situation or a foreclosure? Um, I, I'd have to I don't know that I have a clear answer for you. I'd like to think I'd look at what makes most sense. If it's a imminent tax sale, maybe I'd go with that one because foreclosures can take a full year because we're a judicial foreclosure state. It, it does take a long time. The foreclosure moratorium um, needs to lift. Then the foreclosure process has to begin. It can take a year after that. We do have some time before people are out on the streets. So it would benefit the program to have the authority to expand it to property tax and people with property tax issues. Uh, it would benefit those people in that situation without a doubt. Um, benefit the program, I'm not sure because I, I do believe there's pent up demand that we just haven't seen come through the door yet. Okay, in both cases as far as yes. mortgages and property tax. Okay. Yes. Right. But we also have a program that's currently addressing pe people where it's an income issue for property tax. And, and maybe we should tweak that program first, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. we, but this money has to, this money has to be spent by December 30th. Yes. But I'm hearing Senator Clarkson say that um, right now property tax sensitivity is based on you know your last year's income. If you tweak that system and look at um, uh, a shorter term, more recent income snapshot, maybe there could be some property tax relief in that way. I, I hear oh, where you're going with right. that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and because I think what you've done is very wise. I mean, you've only looked at the last three months of income. So you are looking at the 80% of the median in area median income in Chittenden County and then the rest of the state. And you're, it looks like it's 18,000. As a result, your income levels are, eh, I've lost yep. it, but I, I feel like I remember 15,000 for three months and 15,000. Yep. Yep. Now that is something so, that um, we plan on looking at, you know, when we were designing this program and it was launching for July and August, we could look back at three months and say, what was your March or, you know, April, May, June income when you apply in July, that made sense. Um, we need to, we have plans to look at if those income limits should alter in round two that's starting up soon, because maybe your income loss was not the most recent 90 days, but maybe it was that you didn't get paid in March, April, May, but that's not 90 days from when you're applying in September or October. But, you know, losing one's income for three months it has a lasting ripple effect in a household. Um, Huge. They, yeah. Huge. So, so we're, we're looking at how we can um, reasonably and responsibly look at those income limits, uh, knowing that maybe it's not, may, maybe you did come back part-time um, recently, but that you had zero income back in the late spring. You know, all, all good things to think about. 
Laura, thank you very much. Good to see you again. Uh, committee, we are uh, pretty much out of time. Unless somebody has anything to say, we'll see you at one o'clock on the Senate floor. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maura, for this. Thank Thanks, you. Maura. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.